Part 4 Forest of Grace Chapter 1 Brindaban, anticipation filled my heart. With each step I trod on the eight-mile stretch, I was thrilled. Lining the asphalt road were huge tamarind trees and spacious fields. A bullock cart, overloaded with straw, passed slowly by, its wooden wheels creaking, while the team of oxen strained, snorting foam from their nostrils and clacking their hooves over the asphalt. A jalopy of a bus approached from behind and halted. The door swung open and the driver, beaming a semi-toothless smile, beckoned me to climb aboard for a free ride. How could I refuse such hospitality? The driver wore the visible markers of a religious life, a shaved head with a tuft of hair at the back and sheet of cloth wrapped around his waist. When we arrived in the town of Brindaban, I asked him where the river was, and he pointed the way. A few steps later, a farmer stood blocking my path his palms pressed together in supplication. Gleefully, he exclaimed, Welcome to Brindavan. Whoever comes here is Lord Krishna's special guest. Clasping my hands, he effused, I am a Brijabasi, a resident of Brindavan. It is my duty to make you happy. Let me arrange food and accommodation for you. Thank you very much, I said but I'll be happy to sleep on the bank of the river and beg for food. Casting his head down, he grew desperate. Please accept my humble service. If you do not, how can I show myself before my Krishna? His humility was too difficult to deny. I instantly loved this Brijabasi, feeling him to be a family member, welcoming me home. He arranged my stay at the ashram of an old blind swami and departed. That afternoon, I left the crowded ashram to roam into one of the lush forests of Brindavan. As I walked, I pressed my feet into the soft, fine sands. Strolling among ancient trees whose trunks swirled upward, each one cloaked with white, orange, and yellow flowers and shining green leaves. A sweet lowing attracted my eyes to a herd of white cows grazing on the shrubs. With wide, glistening eyes, they gazed at me as if they had always known me. Strangely, I felt the same for them. I walked on, A startling, protracted caw rang out, and I turned to see a peacock. The plumes of his brilliant tail fanned out and his iridescent neck moving gracefully back and forth. Next, a deep resonant drew me to a huge white bull that loped along the pathway, chewing lazily on scattered shrubs. Looking up into the trees, I saw a flock of bright green parrots with curving orange beaks and bright red eyes. They chattered to one another, took note of me, and then soared off into the sky. Monkeys with brown fur, pink faces, and green eyes swung from branch to branch like mischievous children all the while screaming, Tee! Tee! Through the treetops, I could hear the rumbling of monsoon clouds. Perfumed by blossoming flowers, the breeze carried a cool mist that caressed my skin. But of all the lovely sights and sounds, it was the song of devotees chanting hymns that most lifted my heart. Small girls balanced clay water pots on their heads as they sang, Radhe, Radhe, 
and dance down the sandy pathway lined with forest, shrines, ashrams, and thatched houses. I followed the children until we reached a clearing. There I beheld the river Yamuna, winding with a gentle majesty through the forest. Wooden rowboats plied along, transporting ladies in colorful saris, men with white turbans casually wrapped around their heads, and talkative children whose skinny, restless legs splashed in the water. Lining the riverbank were medieval domes of intricately carved red stone, under which Brijabasis gathered for shelter from the sun and rain, all the while chanting Krishna's names. As temple bells resounded in the distance, my heart swelled with surprise and gratitude. After more than a year of wandering, I felt that I had finally found home again. I saw a sadhu sitting in the hollow of a tree near the riverbank, whom I was told was a hundred and ten years old. He wore only a burlap loincloth, and his matted hair wrapped his head like a crown. His aged face drooped with folds of skin, and he had to lift his eyelids with his fingers in order to see. With a stroke of the hand, he beckoned me. I soon discovered that he was a Moni Baba, one who has taken a vow never to speak, and his only means of communication was a piece of broken slate and a clump of chalk. As I squatted down beside him, he scratched two large words on the ten-inch slate. People think, he wrote. Then he erased the words with his bare fingers and continued writing, That the people. He erased again and wrote, Of Brindaban, erase. Are crazy, erase. It is true, erase. We are crazy, Erase. Then he wrote in big letters, For Krishna. This too he erased. Then wrote again in sections, If you stay here, you will become crazy too. Then he smiled, as if he knew something that I didn't. The next day Gary and I met again. With huge festival crowds congesting the town, Gary longed to escape to a quiet place in the Himalayas. But the mystical forest of Brindaban was pulling me, and I decided to remain for a few more days. Gary would go ahead, we agreed, and in five short days we would meet at the Brahma Ghat in Haridwar to carry on our pilgrimage to Amarnath. Sure, we would see each other soon. We said goodbye easily. In those few days, I saw no foreigners in Brindavan. Indeed, it appeared that Brindavan's charm was hidden from the West. I rejoiced, for I had observed that when Westerners frequented any place in India, commercialism tended to spread like an epidemic. Affected by the atmosphere, a longing to learn about Krishna awakened in my heart. Since that day they had been stolen from me on a Delhi street corner, I no longer had any books to refer to. When I asked a local man where I could find books in English about Krishna, he directed me to the Ram Krishna Hospital. Reaching the neatly kept one-story building, I entered and inquired about books. Nurses and housekeepers stared curiously. They brought me to the director of the hospital, Shakti Maharaj, a disciple of the famous yogi Sri Ram Krishna. Just then, 
A mutilated woman was hurried in. She had been hit by a bus right outside the gate and was a bloody mess. The staff frantically assembled to save her, preoccupied by the crisis. Still, Shakti Maharaj turned to me and asked, How may I help you? I knew it wasn't good timing, and I was myself stricken by the crisis, but I asked anyway, Maharaj, do you have any books about Krishna in English? He stared at me in disbelief. This is a hospital, not a library. Come back if you're sick. He reached out and touched my forearm. No, stay, he said. Offering me a seat, he promised to return in a few minutes. When he returned, he drew a map and explained, You should go toward the temple of Madan Mohan. Everyone knows where it is. Close by is the ashram of Swami Bone Maharaj. They will have English books. I followed the map, walking along various roads and pathways. On top of a grassy hill overlooking the Yamuna River was one of the most beautiful sights my eyes had ever beheld, an intricately carved temple of red sandstone. It was an octagonal spire that rose about 60 feet into the sky, then tapered and again widening at the top to form a huge flower-like disc. This was the 450-year-old temple of Madan Mohan. It evoked more than just the power and reverence of a grand religious monument, but a feeling of intimacy that touched my soul. Climbing down the hill and through a narrow lane, I approached the ashram and, unlatching the gate, entered a quaint courtyard. To my right was a temple of Krishna. To my left, a small temple of Lord Shiva and a flourishing garden of Tulsi bushes. Tulsi, in the botanical family of basil, is widely considered sacred to Hindus. A young Bengali sadhu appeared from the kitchen, dusting flour from his apron. I welcome you, he said, introducing himself as Gopesh Krishna. Little did I know that in years to come, this simple cook would become the guru of that mission. He led me into a small office where he offered me some water and an English book about Krishna before returning to the kitchen. I read for several hours. Then returning the book to the bookcase, I set out for the Yamuna. But at the main gate, I encountered a man in his mid-twenties with sparkling blue eyes and white skin. He had a shaven head and was clad in saffron robes. My name is Asim Krishnadas, he smiled. Welcome to Brindavan. Offering me a seat, he excused himself for a moment and returned with a plate of fluffy rice and spiced vegetables. Eating eagerly, I asked him how he came to live in India. He told me that his given name was Alan Shapiro and was from New York. He had traveled through Europe and Israel, and ultimately his search for spirituality brought him to India. In the Punjab state, he said, he met a saint named Mukunda Hari, who advised him, Go to Brindavan. There you will find everything. Asim smiled. His words were prophetic, he said. As I was leaving, he offered... If there's anything I could do to serve you, that will be my greatest joy. The following day, I roamed alone in the forest and eventually returned to the riverbank just beneath the hill of Madan Mohan Temple. I was to leave early the next morning for Hardwar, where Gary was waiting for me. When night fell, I offered my farewell to the land of Brindavan. But my mind was divided. 
Lying down to sleep on the earthen riverbank, I thought, Brindavan is attracting my heart like no other place. What is happening to me? Please reveal your divine will. With this prayer, I drifted off to sleep. Before dawn, I awoke to the ringing of temple bells, signaling that it was time to begin my journey to Hardwar. But my body lay there like a corpse. Gasping in pain, I couldn't move. A blazing fever consumed me from within, and under the spell of unbearable nausea, my stomach churned. Like a hostage, I lay on that riverbank. As the sun rose, celebrating a new day, I felt my life force sinking. Death that morning would have been a welcome relief. Hours passed. At noon, I still lay there. This fever will surely kill me, I thought. Just when it couldn't get any worse, I saw in the overcast sky something that chilled my heart. Vultures circled above, their keen sights focused on me. It seemed the fever was cooking me for their lunch, and they were just waiting until I was well done. They hovered lower and lower. One swooped to the ground, a huge black and white bird with a long curving neck and sloping beak. It stared, sizing up my condition, then jabbed its pointed beak into my ribcage. My body recoiled, my mind screamed, and my eyes stared back at my assailant, seeking pity. The vulture flapped its gigantic wings and rejoined its fellow predators circling above. On the damp soil, I gazed up at the birds as they soared in impatient circles. Suddenly, my vision blurred and I momentarily blacked out. When I came to, I felt I was burning alive from inside out, perspiring, trembling, and gagging. I gave up all hope. Suddenly, I heard footsteps approaching. A local farmer herding his cows noticed me and took pity. Pressing the back of his hand to my forehead, he looked skyward toward the vultures, and understanding my predicament, lifted me onto a bullock cart. As we jostled along the muddy paths, the vultures followed overhead. The farmer entrusted me to a charitable hospital where the attendants placed me in the free ward. Eight beds lined each side of the room. The impoverished and sadhu patients alike occupied all 16 beds. For hours, I lay unattended in a bed near the entrance. Finally, that evening, the doctor came, and after performing a series of tests, concluded that I was suffering from severe typhoid fever and dehydration. In a matter-of-fact tone, he said, You will likely die, but we will try to save your life. Taking the thermometer out of my mouth, he read it and pronounced, No solid food for the next week. Your diet will be glucose water only. With those words, he departed. Overcome by fear and nausea, with no strength in my body and teetering between life and death, I lay there. There was little money to treat the patients in this charitable ward, so we received only the crude basics. Once a day, the doctor made the rounds, giving a few minutes to each patient. Nurses appeared from time to time, but not a single one spoke English. Other patients wailed in agony all night long. The first night I was there, one man died. 
and death would have been a blessing to an emaciated old man in the bed next to mine. Silently bearing his miseries, he would lean over to pass red urine in a small pot kept on his bed. He coughed blood constantly, often spraying my face. One sweltering night, as I lay immobilized in anguish, Patients throughout the room howled, moaned, and screamed in agony amid a stench of sweat, mold, and excrement. I thought, why am I here? Why did I leave my home and family and friends in Highland Park? And what about poor Gary? He'll never know why I didn't meet him. Placing my life in the hands of God, I prayed. I am yours. Please do with me what you will. All night long, I softly chanted the words that had begun to bring me solace in the most troubled moments. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama. Hari, Hari. The next morning, having somehow heard news that I was ill, Asim came to visit me. Accompanying him was a beautiful old man whose eyes glistened with spiritual love. This is one of the greatest saints in all of Brindavan, Asim said. His name is Krishnadas Babaji. Babaji wore only a simple white cloth around his waist. It extended just above his knees. Another piece of cloth draped around the back of his neck and hung over his chest. His head and face sprouted bright white hairs. With indescribable compassion, the elderly Babaji gazed upon me. Then reaching out, he patted my head and burst out, Hare Krishna! Every day they both came to bless me. And every day Babaji filled my heart with a healing joy, and his laughter sprang from the bliss of his soul. One day two young doctors in training came to my bed and took turns firing off a litany of questions. But I had one question for them. What disease does that man in the next bed have? One of them stared blankly and replied, Contagious tuberculosis. He added, Please be careful, sir. If you inhale his cough, or if even one drop of his blood falls in your mouth, you will catch it too. What? What? Then why is he kept in a crowded room, I asked. It is our policy, he said. No one is quarantined unless the laboratory tests return positive. Unfortunately, our laboratory is closed because the technician is sick with tuberculosis. Therefore, no quarantines are permitted. Lifting his umbrella, he strutted toward the door and turned to me. It is certain that the man beside you has the contagious germ, so please be careful. It was pleasant to meet you. Good day, sir. A few days later, the poor soul died before my eyes. One day, sitting on my hospital bed, I wrote these words to my family. Where there is faith, fear cannot exist. May you all be blessed with good health, happy lives, peace of mind, and love for God. Richard, Brindavan, September 1971. After about 10 days, the doctor released me with the instruction You must not travel for one month. Pointing his finger into my face, he warned, 
the way you sadhus travel, you will not survive. Stay in one place and eat simple rice. The news that I was not to leave troubled me. My first thoughts were to poor Gary. What had he thought when I did not meet him in Haridwar? After tearing him away from all of his friends, now I had abandoned him alone in India. Would we ever meet again? But part of me was happy to stay and discover what more Brindaban held for me. Chapter 2 Krishnadas Babaji and Asim kindly brought me to their ashram to recuperate. The whole first day I rested. The next day, early in the morning, Asim asked if I would like to meet his guru. I eagerly consented. In a courtyard of tulsi trees, I first saw the man, a stately figure in his seventies sitting on a wooden chair, eyes closed, chanting on prayer beads. This was Swami Ban Maharaj. Clean-shaven and with short white hair, he wore a simple t-shirt and the saffron lower cloth of a sannyasi. When he heard us approach, he slowly opened his eyes. Please come, he said, gesturing for us to sit on the ground near him. Smiling, he asked my name. Ah, yes, Richard, I am happy to welcome you as our guest. It is no accident that you have come to Brindavan. Do you know what is Brindavan? His warm manner was compelling. I will be most grateful if you explain, I said. He placed his prayer beads on a nearby table, raised his forefinger, and spoke in flawless English. Beyond our temporary material existence is the spiritual sky, or Brahman. This is the destination sought by those who worship God as impersonal. Within the spiritual sky, there are spiritual planets where the one supreme Lord resides in his various forms. Brindavan is the highest realm of the spiritual world. He began to recite ancient Sanskrit verses to verify his words. The rhythm of his words entranced me. Five thousand years ago, he said, the Supreme Lord Krishna descended into our world and manifested his own abode, Vrindavan. Those with pure bhakti or devotion can still see Krishna performing his pastimes here. He paused, looked deeply into my eyes, and said again, It is not by chance that you have come here, Richard. We welcome you back home to Brindavan and to our ashram. Faithful disciples began to file through the quaint wooden entrance gate, offering their love. A middle-aged woman approached Ban Maharaj and handed him a golden flower. He turned back to me. You may stay with us as long as you like, Richard. You will be my special guest. He nodded in the direction of the temple where Krishnadas Babaji was pacing back and forth, chanting on beads. You see Krishnadas Babaji over there, he said. I nodded. You stand to gain great spiritual benefit if you spend your mornings with him. He is a Paramhamsa, a perfected soul, who is absorbed in kirtan, the chanting of God's names, day and night. The Swami's eyes filled with tears as he praised the elderly Babaji. 
His devotion, he continued, is an inspiration to all of us. Stay with him in the mornings and you will learn the essence of bhakti yoga. In the afternoons, feel free to roam through the forests of Vrindavan and experience the divine atmosphere. He told me that there would be no pressure on me. He said that for residents of the ashram, there were strict rules, but added, You are my special guest and may come and go as you please. Please be comfortable and happy. Between his fingertips, Ban Maharaj twirled the flower. Each morning, he said, I sit here in this courtyard. You are always welcome to come and talk with me. I bowed in gratitude. Thank you. In my sickly condition, I felt his generosity to be a life-saving gesture. Asim, too, smiled at the kindness I was receiving. Education was an important mission for Ban Maharaj, who established a college in Brindavan. He himself was highly educated and distinguished in character the pride of an orthodox Brahmin family from East Bengal. Asim explained that when he was only 20 years old, Swami Ban Maharaj met his guru, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati. Upon hearing his powerful message and seeing his spotless character, Ban Maharaj offered his life to the path of devotional service. Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati boldly declared that no one should be categorized on the basis of race, nationality, or caste, that we are all eternal souls, not the temporary body. He taught that people must be respected according to their personal qualities, not their birth. Boldly exposing the modern perversion of the caste system, he faced plots to end his life. Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati emphasized the spirit of genuine devotion, or bhakti, and dismissed mundane superficialities and pseudo-spirituality. At the young age of 23, Ban Maharaj took the vows of a sannyasi lifelong celibacy, and began to preach throughout India. He was among the first of Bhakti Siddhanta's disciples to be sent to England and Germany in the 1920s. Each morning as the sun was rising, Asim and I met in the courtyard to speak with Swami Ban Maharaj. Afterward, when Asim left for the college to assist his guru, I hurried to the temple. There from 8 o'clock until half past noon, Krishnadas Babaji sat every day alone on the floor, absorbed in singing devotional songs. I sat by his side. His eyes radiated with spiritual emotion, and he often struggled to restrain tears. While chanting, he played a two-headed clay drum called murdanga. Although his voice was simple, it was saturated with a devotional power that penetrated my heart. Every morning at 4.30, Babaji was given the honor of leading the assembly of monks in prayer. As prayer grew to kirtan, or congregational chanting, everyone danced in joyous abandon. While beating his drum, Babaji, who was small, thin, and old, would dance out from the temple of Krishna and into the courtyard as the rest of the devotees trailed behind him. Entering into a small temple of Shiva, he sang loudly as twenty monks leapt high, bells clanging. Then leading the procession around the Tulsi garden and back into the temple, Babaji performed a grand finale that electrified the normally grave monks who went wild with bliss. This was how every day began in the ashram. At 70 years old, Krishnadas Babaji was like an inexhaustible volcano 
erupting with devotion each time he sang the glories of the Lord. Babaji seemed never to stop chanting. Once when I had dysentery, I raced out to the latrine in the middle of the night and heard his strong, simple voice chanting the Maha Mantra from inside his room. Did he ever stop chanting God's names? Any time I awoke at night, I would quietly wander to the window of his room. In the seclusion of his personal love, he chanted Krishna's name day and night. No one in the ashram could determine when he slept. Except for his outburst, Hare Krishna, in the hospital, Babaji never spoke a word to me, and I assumed he spoke no English. One morning, I rose late and took my bath at the well. With a rope, I lowered the bucket down, filled it with water, and hauled it up. Crouching down on a rock near the well, I scooped the water from the bucket with a brass vessel and poured it over my body. Suddenly I heard a voice. Where were you this morning? I looked around to trace its source, but there was no one around except Krishna Das Babaji. I continued my bath. Again the words boomed out. Where were you this morning? I searched for the source, but again saw only Babaji. I looked at him quizzically. Maybe he knew who was speaking. Looking straight into my eyes, he said in English, Why do you not answer my question? Babaji, I blurted out, I didn't know you spoke English. He replied, That does not answer my question. From that day on, although his most prominent words consisted of Hare Krishna, he spoke to me in fluent English. This impressed me. In India in the early 1970s, most people who knew a word of English, even if they didn't know what it meant, were proud to show it off, especially to foreigners. But Babaji Maharaj, who spoke fluent English, never spoke a word of it until it was required to help someone. Not a trace of arrogance could be detected in him. Perhaps this was the reason he was empowered to chant the holy names constantly. Previously, I had thought that silent meditation was the path of stalwart spiritualists and that chanting and dancing was for sentimental people with no deep philosophical realization. Krishnadas Babaji shattered this misconception. I could not deny the power of his knowledge, detachment, and love. His path was bhakti yoga, devotional service to Krishna. Clearly, the method for awakening that love was his chanting of God's holy names. Babaji was loved all over Brindavan. In many temples, whenever there was a special function, Babaji was invited to lead the kirtan, and sometimes he took me along. One day we entered a crowded temple where hundreds of people were chanting. Krishnadas Babaji chose to sit quietly in the rear, happy just to observe. As soon as somebody noticed him, the kirtan stopped and the guru of that temple came forward and placed the murdanga drum around Babaji's neck, the entire congregation begging him to lead the chanting. With his first beat of the murdanga, the crowd melted in gratitude. When I witnessed this outpouring of love for Babaji, I understood the saying, that it is only when one has no desire for adoration that one is truly qualified to receive it. On the day of Akadasi, a fast day observed twice a month, Krishnadas Babaji would spend the entire night under a sacred tamarind tree, chanting Krishna's names from sunset to sunrise. Joining him, I was amazed. The old man showed no symptoms of fatigue. 
while I struggle to stay awake. For Babaji, this all-night fasting and meditation, I realized, was not a discipline, but simply the natural outpouring of his love for Krishna. As the sun was rising, Babaji exclaimed, Five hundred years ago, under this tree, Lord Chaitanya revealed his love to the world. Babaji, I asked, please tell me about Lord Chaitanya. His eyes beamed, intoxicated by his all-night chanting, he explained. Lord Chaitanya is Krishna, the Supreme Lord, who descended 500 years ago to distribute love of God in the easiest possible way. Ages ago, his appearance was predicted in the scriptures. Although God himself, Lord Chaitanya assumed the role of a devotee just to teach us by his own example. Babaji's voice soared with enthusiasm. The personification of ecstatic love, he wept tears of compassion for all beings. In this age of quarrel and hypocrisy, he taught us, the essential medicine to cure our spiritual disease is the chanting of God's holy names. Lord Chaitanya taught that God has revealed many names through the ages and has invested his potency in all of them. Love of God is the inherent nature of the soul and is dormant within everyone. But we have forgotten. Chanting God's name reawakens that love from within the heart. Lifting his fist, Babaji boldly cried out, Lord Chaitanya rejected all sectarian boundaries and gave one and all equal opportunity to spiritual perfection. His words struck me as so simple and true. I longed to learn more. What is the best way to chant? I asked. His eyes glazed with emotion and closing them, he sang a Sanskrit verse and explained. Lord Chaitanya taught us that one should strive to be more humble than a blade of grass, more tolerant than a tree, and to offer all respect to others while expecting none for oneself. In this way, one could chant the Lord's names constantly. He stroked the grass on the ground between us. You see this grass, he said? It is happy to serve everyone, even by remaining in the most humble position under our feet. Whenever it's stepped on, it comes right back up to serve. We can learn from this humility. He bowed his head toward the tree behind us. You see that tree? It tolerates the burning summer sun while giving us shade. It tolerates bitter cold while giving wood to keep us warm. And it may stay for months without a drop of water while giving us juicy fruits to quench our thirst. All of this without complaint. We should learn tolerance from the tree. Lord Chaitanya taught that we should aspire to be the humble servants of the servant of the servant of the Lord. Only in this way can we taste the nectar of the holy name. Then Babaji stood up and with a hearty laugh rubbed the top of my head and strolled away along the riverbank. I remained staring into the deep blue water of the Yamuna. Still wide from the monsoon rains, she flowed quietly through the forests and fields of Brindavan. I thought, his words are like precious jewels. And because he so sincerely practices them in his life, they deeply penetrate my heart. At that moment, an upsurge of peace sprung from within me. 
I felt I was just where I needed to be. Chapter 3 From halfway across the world, I could feel the anguish of my parents, helpless as they were to communicate their feelings to me. In the year and a half I had been traveling, it was very rare that I stayed in a place long enough to send my family a note with a return address. So it had been a long time since I had had any news from them. In a recent letter, I shared my experiences in Brindavan and included a return address. I awaited their replies. One afternoon, Asim Krishna handed me three letters. Sensing the content, I brought them to the bank of the Yamuna. The first letter was from my father. Tears from his eyes had washed away words and whole passages. Just holding the paper in my hands, I could feel his pain. I thought, what have I done to my father and mother who have dedicated their lives to my welfare? In every line, my father pleaded for me to come home. He wrote, Every day seems to last forever in guilt and worry. What horrible things have I done to you that you have rejected me? He continued, How can I live knowing my son to be living in jungle caves alone with no money? It was signed, Your Broken-Hearted Father. Gazing out across the graceful current of the Yamuna, I felt my heart breaking with his. Then I opened the second envelope. It was from my mother. She longed to know, Why are you in a foreign land for so long? Haven't you found what you're looking for yet? What are you wearing and eating? How is your health? Throughout, she reiterated her love. The third letter was from Larry, my younger brother and dear friend. Larry was an honest and simple person, so I knew that whatever he said would be true. He described the perpetual worry into which I had cast my entire family. Of my mother, he wrote, Don't you understand a mother's love? Mom is in a state of confusion. She helplessly worries day and night about your safety. Then he described my father's condition. Our father's hair is graying. He has aged years since you abandoned us. He stares blindly at a wall lost in grief. Thinking of you, all alone, living in caves and jungles, he cries. Do you want to kill your own father? Is this your idea of religion? Maybe you don't care if he lives or dies, but we love him. If you don't come home, you will be held responsible for his death. My heart pounding, I silently prayed for guidance. As I gazed into the gentle, flowing waters of Yamuna, my whole life played before my mind's eye. I felt so grateful for my family's affection and hated to cause them pain, but this burning in my heart for God's love was stronger than anything else. I could not expect them to understand. I recalled my readings about great persons who in their dedication to God had borne the suffering of breaking 
loved ones' hearts. Upon hearing the call of God, Abraham was willing to sacrifice Isaac, his beloved son. Hearing his calling at Gethsemane, Lord Jesus accepted crucifixion while his mother Mary wept bitterly beneath the cross. His apostles, too, left everything behind to heed his call. Hearing that same inner call, Prince Siddhartha Gautama left his loving family in tears as he disappeared into the forest to travel the path of becoming the Buddha. When the inner voice of God called for him, Shankaracharya, the greatest proponent of the path of non-dualism, left home, breaking his poor mother's heart. And for our sake, Lord Chaitanya left his widowed mother in pools of tears. These saints and avatars are great, I thought, and I am small. Yet a calling, this longing for the divine life, has overcome me. I spent the day on the bank of the Yamuna, praying for my family and praying for guidance. The next morning in the temple courtyard, I sat at the feet of Ban Maharaj and presented him the letters. Tears welled in his eyes as he read them. For a long time, he stared across the courtyard, lost in thought. Then he turned to me and spoke. Long ago, when I was about your age, I accepted a life of renunciation. This caused my mother and father unbearable pain. It was a great test in my life. To break the hearts of your loved ones is often a price you must pay to accept a life of exclusive devotion. But you will see, in the passing of time, they will understand and appreciate your life. In fact, they will be proud of you. In the meantime, there is no restriction in a sadhu meeting his mother or father. You must search your own heart. In my reply to Father, I wrote, My dear Father, on receiving your last letter, dated September 14, 1971, a painful sensation melted into my heart. Listen to what I say, not with ears, but with your tender heart. Each man must choose what he believes to be the most sacred path to follow in his life. If a man does not follow what he truly believes in, his life will have little meaning. With all my heart and all my soul, I believe that the highest purpose in life is to live a life devoted to the one God who lovingly rules over all of us. We are servants of the same Lord. I believe that the root of all man's quarrels and sufferings is his forgetting that highest truth. Since ancient times, there have always been politicians, businessmen, soldiers, etc. And along with these, there have always been those treading the path of truth and living a religious life. But today, everyone has become so engrossed in satisfying their material hunger that God has all but been forgotten. Is it not true that the noblest man is he who is humble, honest, righteous, and respectful to all fellow beings? This is religious life in its truest sense. I believe that this is the life that I must lead. Please trust that all I am doing is striving to lead a life free of malice. For a man of my temperament, to enter into the business world would result in a life 
of no meaning or satisfaction. For when a man fights his own inner nature, he ruins himself. At present, I am rather unsettled. Please, I beg you to give me a little more time to secure my convictions. At that time, we will arrange to unite once more. I will keep in touch with you. In America, many parents of sons are suffering the pain of separation to the army for two to four years, where their son endangers his life for a cause rooted in hate. I pray to you only to have faith that what I seek is for the good of all. Bless you, my loving Father. Bless your tender heart. I will soon tell you my plans, very soon. Richard, Vrindavan, India, September 30, 1971. To my mother, I wrote a letter describing my eating habits and what I was wearing, assuring her that I was in fine health and trying to explain my choice to search for the meaning of life. I thanked her for her loving concern and wished her peace. I knew they could not comprehend my calling. My naive words certainly perpetuated their grief. But I had a simple faith that God understood my heart and would extend his loving hand to help them. Chapter 4 At night, I lay on the rooftop of the ashram, gazing into the starlit Vrindavan sky. Peacocks carried on a dialogue, and the night guards protected the village by loudly calling out to one another the names of God. Radhe Sham Radhe Sham. But of all the sounds of the Brindaba night, the one that most captivated my ears was the melody of the Hare Krishna mantra floating in the breeze from far away. Alternating voices of an old man and woman sang through an amplified speaker all night, every night. These sounds, the guards, the peacocks, the old man and woman singing, created a spiritual symphony that stirred my heart. I thought back to that aged sadhu who had written me a message with a piece of chalk on his broken slate. Was I becoming crazy for Krishna here in magical Brindavan? Traditionally, devotees circumambulate holy places like Brindavan as an act of worship. One night, a mystical force drew me from the rooftop and onto that dusty pathway that wound around the town. Guided by the moonlight, I roamed along the riverbank path that led into the forest. From a distant place, a sound drew me. As I came closer, my anticipation soared. Could it be the same song sung by an old man and woman that had been charming me to sleep each night? I yearned to find its origin. The closer I came, the louder the mantra grew. Yes, it is the same song. Soon I found myself in a quaint temple of Hanuman, the divine monkey who personifies ecstatic devotion where a man and woman in their late seventies were sitting on the floor chanting, their eyes shut 
in intense absorption. They were clothed in worn white cloth and appeared to be farmers. It was about one o'clock in the morning, and I joined them in chanting the familiar melody. When we later parted ways, they invited me to return for lunch the next day. The next afternoon, I stepped from the dusty footpath into Hanuman's temple. Not knowing why, I was brimming with anticipation. Hardly a minute had passed when an Indian man in his mid-twenties approached me. Maharaji wants to meet you now, he said. Me, I asked, pointing to my own chest. Who is Maharaji and how does he know me? Oh, he knows all about you. Will you be so kind to tell me about Maharaji, I asked. Not now. Maharaji is waiting for you. We'll talk later. Taking my hand, he led me into a sunny courtyard where a round man, beaming a beatific smile, sat cross-legged on a wooden bed, a faded checkered blanket wrapped around his body. I drew closer. His face, framed by white stubble, glowed with an otherworldly joy. His squinting eyes seemed to penetrate through the windows of mine and into the mysteries of my life. This was Neem Karoli Baba. While I was living in the Himalayas, I had heard of his extraordinary qualities. His followers affectionately addressed him as Maharaji. As I approached, he was speaking in Hindi to a few Indian disciples who sat on the ground in a semicircle around him. Seeing me, he broke into a contagious smile and welcomed me. He raised his index finger and spoke to me through a translator. You have forsaken wealth and comforts in search of enlightenment and with great struggle have come to India. Now you travel alone and cry for God while your family far away cries for you. With a gracious swoop of his hand, he motioned for me to sit with the others. Have no fears, he said, so serious that his brow furrowed and lips tightened. Rejoice to bear all difficulties. Krishna has heard your prayers and brought you to Brindaban. By chanting the name of Rama and Krishna, everything is accomplished. But, he said, shaking his head, people are creating a hell by their addiction to criticizing and fighting. Do not judge others or fall into those egoistic ways. He seemed to know everything about me and spoke just the words I needed to hear. I was both charmed and amazed. I asked, but almost the whole world has fallen into that trap. How do I avoid it? His eyes twinkled as he smiled and said, Love everyone, serve everyone, and feed everyone. Serve like Hanuman, without selfishness and greed. This is the key to realizing God. Assuming the mood of a playful child, he put his hand to his mouth as if eating and invited us to take the sacred food. As we entered the special hall for a meal, I expressed to my guide how eager I was to hear about his guru. He obliged and said, I'm from the village of Nandital in the Himalayas, and from childhood I've loved Maharaji. We sat in lines on the floor. A devotee placed leaf plates in front of us and filled them with scoops of wonderful food. My host was dressed in a button-down white shirt and pants, his wavy black hair oiled and neatly combed. After reciting a short prayer, he related some memories of Neem Karoli Baba. 
Maharaji is a Siddha Purusha, a perfected being. I have personally witnessed his knowledge of past, present, and future. Actually, he always knows where I am and what I'm doing. He sipped from his clay cup of a cooling yogurt drink called Lassi. Let me tell you something else, he added. Maharaji is sometimes in two distant places at the same time. This has been documented. We are always expecting him to appear or disappear at the least expected moment. He's unpredictable. At any moment, he may appear or disappear, chastise or praise, speak in riddles or profound truths, or instruct someone to renounce the world or get married. But the one thing we know for sure, he always brings out the very best in us and carries us closer to God. He smiled with pride. Neem Karoli Baba, although a grave yogi, can be so charming in his playfulness, just like Hanuman. I was served steaming halava, farina sautéed in butter and steamed in sweet syrup. The delectable aroma filled the room. As we ate, Neem Karoli Baba appeared in the doorway. Noting us, relishing our food, he smiled with joy. I rejoiced, too, seeing his sweet mood. He personified everything he taught us. Love everyone, serve everyone, and feed everyone. Just like Hanuman. The next day, I returned and found Maharaji surrounded by a few followers reciting the story of Hanuman's devotion from the Ramayan. Transfixed, Neem Karoli Baba trembled, tears streaming from his eyes. For the next few weeks, I spent an hour or so sitting each day at Maharaji's feet. He didn't give formal lectures while I was there, but rather he spoke casually with his followers or sang kirtan. I was fascinated by how he would respond to questions with brief but concise wisdom, such as, just serve every creature in God's creation with humility, respect, and love. Or, he would say, just sing the names of Rama and everything else will be attained. One day he turned to me, his eyes seeming to search my soul. Then shooting up a single finger, he exclaimed, Ek! 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 God is one. At that time, I was not aware that people from the West knew of Neem Karoli Baba until the arrival of a celebrity well-known in my generation, Baba Ramdas. One day, while I sat at the feet of Maharaji, Ramdas and a small entourage of Westerners unexpectedly turned up at the ashram. This icon of the 1960s counterculture, formerly the controversial Professor Richard Alpert of Harvard University, had together with Timothy Leary popularized LSD as a means of expanding consciousness. Upon entering, Ramdas meekly bowed his graying head in the lap of his guru, as a small child might. Affection poured from his guru's heart as he playfully tugged the graying beard of his disciple and patted his head like a puppy. Laughing, Maharaji said, We were waiting for you. How beautiful it was for me to see a distinguished Harvard scholar and powerful social icon enjoy being treated like a naughty little boy. Maharaji beamed a smile upon all of us, then waved his hand, exclaiming, Jao prasadam, go take lunch. 
Maharaji must have mystically known of their unannounced arrival, as an amazing feast had been prepared in larger quantity than usual that day. I had the pleasure of bringing Ramdas and his entourage to some of the holy places in Brindaban. One day we attended a kirtan and talk given by Anandamai Ma, who had an ashram in Brindaban. She remembered me from our meeting in the Himalayas, and as she gave her lecture to a large audience, she looked toward me and nodded, then reconfirmed the spiritual direction I was heading with the words, Whenever you possibly can, sustain the flow of the holy name. To repeat his name is to be in his presence. If you associate with the Supreme Friend, he will reveal his true beauty to you. When the program ended, Ramdas and I fell into a soul-searching discussion. But night was falling, so he invited me to continue our talk the next day at his residence. I arrived early at the Jaipur Dharamshala, a guest house on a noisy lane with cloth shops and food stalls and congested with bicycle rickshaws honking loud rubber horns to scatter the foot traffic. Baba Ramdas opened the door, morning light beaming on his welcoming face. I looked beyond him into the room, which resembled not the residence of a distinguished professor, but that of a simple sadhu. Graciously, he led me to the only piece of furniture, a wooden bed. After offering me a seat, he too sat cross-legged, spreading out his flowing white robes. We faced each other. His graying hair streamed from his balding head and draped onto his back and shoulders. A breeze from the nearby window slightly wisped his peppered beard. His large blue eyes glowed, and the faint wrinkles in their corners creased deeply as he smiled. Speaking no words, we simply looked into each other's hearts through the channel of the eyes. Those moments seemed timeless. That long gaze we shared affected my vision in such a way that at times he looked like an innocent child and at other times like an ancient stoic sage. I reflected on a verse from the Bhagavad Gita. As the eternal soul passes in this body from boyhood to youth to old age, the soul similarly passes into another body at death. The self-realized soul is not bewildered by such a change. A sublime peace filled the room. Perhaps half an hour passed in this way before Ramdas took a deep breath, slightly shrugged his shoulders, and broke our silence with the invocation, Om. Could you tell me something about your spiritual journey, I asked him. I was eager to learn how he had come to India and how he met his guru. Ramdas shifted his weight on the wooden slab of a bed, as if readying himself for the narrative. A few years back, he began, I came to India. I brought with me a supply of LSD, hoping to find someone who might understand more about these substances than we did in the West. In my travels, I met an American sadhu, Bhagavan Das, who guided me to Neem Karoli Baba. That was in 1967. I was grieving the death of my mother. Maharaji saw into my heart and consoled me with unimaginable compassion. Without my even saying a word about my life, he could read my heart and tell the confidential details of my past. His powers, combined with his love, wisdom, and humor, transformed my life. I had a similar experience when I first met him, I said. 
He seemed to know everything about me. Baba Ramdas smiled. One day Maharaji asked me, where is the medicine? At first I was confused, but Bhagavan Das suggested he was asking for LSD. Intrigued, I held out three pills of pure LSD, and to my astonishment, he swallowed them all. I was prepared to clinically monitor his reactions, but nothing happened, nothing. His consciousness is beyond LSD. Having myself witnessed the powers of Himalayan yogis, I laughed in wonder. Ramdas sat cross-legged with back erect. His palms rested upward on his lap. I couldn't separate myself from Maharaji's association, and so I stayed as long as I could. Accepting me as his disciple, he gave me the name Ramdas, which means servant of Lord Ram. Months passed in his extraordinary company. As influential as I was in America, Maharaji forbid me from bringing anyone to him. Ramdas shook his head in disbelief. He had no inclination for anything material, neither money, fame, or followers. I'd never seen anyone like him. Apprehending anew the love he felt for his guru, his voice began to tremble. When I sit with Maharaji, I feel that I have unconditional love for everyone in the world. In that same year, 1971, Ramdas published his story in the classic, Be Here Now. As the day passed, a sense of brotherhood grew between us as we shared the realizations and inspirations we had gained in our spiritual journeys. Before parting, I confided in him a concern that had come to weigh heavily on my mind. I said, Mother India has become my spiritual home. I have so much still to discover, but I fear that my next visa extension will be denied and I'll be forced to leave. Baba Ramdas closed his eyes and submerged into deep thought. Despite the commotion from the busy street outside, the room was serene. I closed my eyes as well and drifted into the tranquility of meditation. Five minutes passed. When I opened my eyes, I found Ramdas gazing at me with a gentle smile. He said softly, You may have to leave the geographical boundaries of India. However, you never have to leave Bharat, the spirit of India within. Chapter 5 Dysentery, an all-too-common malady for foreigners in India, soon struck me down. Weakness, nausea, and repeated dashes to the latrine became my daily reality. Without the selfless care of my friend, Asim, it would have been far more difficult. He often reassured me, Bhakti means to serve with love and devotion. While I lay on the floor, Asim brought boiled rice, yogurt, and fleecied husk. Each time he visited, he would share his love for Krishna and Brindaban. In this way, my sickness became just another episode that helped to cement our friendship. Early one morning, I had regained my health and Asim invited me to join him on a journey into the inner villages around Brindaban. He told me that Braj, 
was the name of the whole area around the town of Brindaban, and that Krishna had performed his pastimes in this area. Braj consists of about 80 miles of forest fields and villages and over 5,000 temples of Krishna, some of the largest in all of India and others quite quaint. Asim said, You'll be fascinated by the Brittubasi's natural love for Krishna. His blue eyes widened with enthusiasm. Shall we go? A few minutes later, we were bouncing and creaking along in a dilapidated local bus. Fields of golden wheat and mustard, its yellow flowers bending in the wind, stretched out on all sides. Every so often, poor farmers on the side of the road would flag down the bus and climb aboard. Their clothes were ragged. Some of them suffered cataracts, skin diseases, or untreated infections. But they were blissful as they sang devotional songs, clapped their hands, and danced on the moving bus. Old women with wrinkles creviced into their dark, leathery skin spontaneously rose to their feet, raised their arms, and danced while shyly covering their heads with tattered saris. They beamed with the exuberance of children. In the villages, the Brijabasis, although poor, smiled radiantly and greeted one another with Jiradhe, the name of the compassionate, feminine aspect of Krishna. They loved God, not just as the supreme creator, but also as an intimate neighbor in their village. The women drew water from a well and carried it on the top of their heads in round clay pots, smiling as they passed, chanting, Radhe Radhe. From their clay stoves, the pungent smell of burning, dried cow dung patties drifted in the air. The men of the village shaved their heads each month as an offering of devotion and spent their days herding cows, plowing fields with their oxen, or selling their wares along the footpath. The skinny children, eyes sparkling, jumped about, playing with sticks and balls. Everybody, man, woman, and child, smiled at me and called out, Radhe, Radhe, as they passed. I observed hundreds of villagers coming to the temples with offerings of milk, butter, and sweets, some praying and others singing and dancing for the pleasure of their Lord. Walking through this other world, I reflected, the religion of these people is not reserved for Sundays or holidays, but is intrinsic to every aspect of their daily lives. It is utterly spontaneous. One afternoon, Asim and I were relaxing on the hill of Madan Mohan Temple, overlooking the river Yamuna, sitting in the grass as black bees hummed a meditative drone around us. I stretched my legs and leaned back against a boundary wall of red stone. There I revealed my mind. Asim, I asked, could you explain your understanding of deity worship? I told him of how in my travels through India, I'd found almost everybody worshiping the carved image of the Lord. The yogis and Shivites worshiped the Shiva Lingam or statue of Lord Shiva, and the Buddhists made elaborate offerings to the deity of Lord Buddha. Some people from Western religions condemn all this as idolatry, I said. But Christians offer prayers to statues or paintings of Jesus, as well as the Holy Crucifix. I told him about how, when I was in Italy, I visited the convent of St. Damiano of Assisi, where Jesus spoke to St. Francis from the wooden crucifix on the altar and ordered him to restore his church. And Jews offer articles of veneration to the Torah, while Muslims too, who condemn idol worship, bow repeatedly to the Kaaba 
in holy Mecca. I knew there were differences in explanations as to the meaning of these forms of worship, but I saw the common idea they shared to focus on a form or sound that connects our consciousness to the divinity. I wondered what Asim's impressions were as they related to Krishna worship. At that moment, Krishnadas Babaji strolled by and erupted into his trademark and blissful Hare Krishna. We bowed in joy as he passed. Although it was I who asked him the question, I realized that Asim was giving me the gift of coming to some of my own conclusions. You know, I went on, when I see the unbelievable devotion of devotees like Krishnadas Babaji while they worship the deity, I can't dismiss it as idol worship. When I see such high moral and spiritual character, I can't dismiss these people as idolaters. They seem to be experiencing love of God in their worship. Didn't Jesus say you can judge a tree by its fruit? Asim smiled with the reassurance of an elder brother, then leaned forward and prompted, Yes, go on. I told him when I first saw deity worship in India, it had repelled me a little, striking me as strange and superstitious. But after spending so much time with holy people who naturally accept their deity as a form through which to communicate with the one God, I have come to accept deity worship as beautiful. Now I want to understand the scriptural philosophy behind it. Can you help me? Asim sat up near a patch of tulsi bushes, rubbed his chin in deep thought, and took a moment before replying. Really, he said, I'm not qualified to explain these things, but I will share what I have heard from my guru and what I've read in the Vedic scriptures. As the bees moved from flower to flower, collecting nectar, I drank in his words. He said, God is unlimited and independent, Asim began. To say he cannot appear in the deity form is to limit him. The Vedas also condemn idol worship. Historically, there were traditions in both East and West where people concocted forms and worshipped them out of superstition with no conception of the one God. Quite often, they had selfish or evil motives. It is this type of idolatry that has been condemned through the ages. In the age of the Bible and Quran, it was common among non-believers. But this is not the type of deity worship approved of by the Vedas. Legitimate deity worship, according to the Vedas, is a science in which the Lord is called with devotional rites to appear in designated forms. In these forms, he accepts our devotional offerings, all for the purpose of purifying the worshiper's body, mind, and words by fixing it in the remembrance of the Lord. The aim is to please the Lord through surrender and love. A butterfly with iridescent purple, red, and yellow wings fluttered by and landed on Asim's thigh. He sat still, appreciating its beauty. Just look, he said, his voice overflowing with happiness. Creation is a gallery of art with a masterpiece wherever we look. I long to meet the artist. Everything emanates from the Lord. All material elements are the Lord's energy. By His will, He may choose to appear in His own energy as a deity to help us focus our minds and senses in loving servitude. 
Just as electricity manifests in a light bulb to radiate light, so God can permeate the deity with his presence. Electricity is invisible to the naked eye, and the bulb by itself gives light only when the electrical energy infuses the bulb with its presence. Then we can see and feel the light. In a similar way, the Lord may appear in the tangible form of a deity to help us see and feel his presence and reciprocate with our love. Smiling, he asked me if he had made sense. I nodded, a feeling of calm permeating my heart. That year, after an abundant monsoon season of rains, Brindaban was filled with lush forests and pastures. It was autumn, and the days were warm while the nights grew cold. I watched in fascination as the residents of Brindaban were preparing to celebrate one of their holiest festivals. Followers on the path of bhakti celebrate God's love with the joy of their own love, and the festivals are rich with spontaneity. Wherever I wandered, everyone anticipated the full moon night of October. According to the scripture, Srimad Bhagavatam, this was the night when Lord Krishna performed the rasa dance. Profusely glorified in art, poetry, and drama, the rasa dance, I would learn, is one of the deepest revelations of spiritual love. The whole of Brindaban was buzzing with excitement and the markets buzzing with devotees who were purchasing decorations for their temples, ornaments for their deities, and food for their feasts. On this night, all the 5,000 temples in the region arranged to host a celebration. Just before sunset, a group of disciples assembled around Ban Maharaj in the courtyard to hear him explain the meaning of the rasa dance. This is not like any worldly dance wherein people try to satisfy their material senses, he began. While the gopis live as cowherd maids, they embody the highest expression of the soul's love for God. For pleasing the Lord is their exclusive aspiration. This dance represents the most perfect intimacy between the soul and God, free of any tinge of selfish desire, but charged with the fullest bliss. On this night, when Krishna called them from their homes with the sweet song of his flute, the gopis forsook everything they had and risked dangers and social rejection, all to satisfy the Lord. When they reached Krishna, the Supreme Lord, he admitted that in the span of creation, he had no power to sufficiently repay the gopis for their pure devotion. But in reciprocation, he expanded himself to dance simultaneously with each gopi in their eternal spiritual bodies for a night of endless joy. Bon Maharaj turned his face toward the sinking sun and the rose-color light glinted in his eyes as he concluded. In a few minutes we will celebrate, praying to someday follow the lead of the gopis. In the Tulsi garden of Bon Maharaja's temple, the devotees had worked all day constructing a throne by weaving thousands of tiny fragrant flowers together. Now as the time for celebration arrived, they ceremoniously carried the deities from the altar to the throne amid offerings of sweets and savorings. The moon rose in the east, Full and golden. In Brindaban, this Ras Purnima moon is celebrated 
as the most beautiful moon of the year. Devotees welcome it with songs composed specially for this occasion. As the moon climbed higher, its golden light illuminated the four directions. All the while, Krishna Das Babaji sang with deep emotion while everyone else blissfully chanted in response. Joining them, I fixed my mind on the enchanting vision of Radha and Krishna in the moonlit flower forest of Brindaban. As the moon ascended still higher, it spread its silvery hue on every leaf and flower. Mother Earth seemed lit up by its touch. Bathed in the sweetness of that pearl moon, everyone was beaming, the deities, the forest, and we who worshipped. In this way, we sang late into the night for the Lord's pleasure. How deeply my time in Brindaban was affecting my heart. In the sweetness of those moments, I thought how unconditional spiritual love for God was a higher experience than attaining mystic powers wherein one could perform supernatural feats or even liberation wherein one was freed from all sufferings and anxieties. In spiritual love, like that of the gopis, a devotee fully gives his or herself for the pleasure of the Lord and could fully relish the intimacy of God's love. On another such moonlit night, as the night birds crooned in the temple garden, Swami Ban Maharaj, sitting back on his wooden chair, gazed at me intently. He said, I have been carefully examining you, Richard. He paused to prepare me for what was to come. Tonight, I would like to initiate you as my disciple. He held up a string of prayer beads carved from the wood of Tulsi. I have sanctified these for you. Are you willing to accept? A chilly breeze whisked across the courtyard. My mind swung between gratitude and pain. I was honored to be asked by him, yet I dreaded the thought of disappointing him. I couldn't accept without sufficient conviction. I am indebted to you, I replied in a frail voice, for all the inspiration you've showered on me. But I have vowed not to accept initiation from any guru until I have confidence that I will remain faithful throughout my life. I believe it would be an act of disrespect toward your holiness for me to make such a commitment without appropriate sincerity. Tears welled in Ban Maharaja's eyes as he patted my head and spoke. I'm pleased by your sincerity. I will put no pressure on you. You must follow your heart. The members of the ashram would like to call you by a spiritual name. So if you permit me, I'll give you a name, not an initiation name, but an affectionate name. You may use this name until you decide to accept initiation. I nodded in agreement. Ban Maharaj said, We'll call you Ratin Krishna Das. Ratin Krishna means Krishna, who is the charioteer of Arjuna, and Das means you are his servant. I bowed my head in gratitude. There is one problem. His eyes narrowed. Everyone is complaining about your long, unkempt hair. Why don't you shave your head like all the other ashramites? I pleaded. To me, shaving the head represents surrendering to a mentor. Until that decision is made, 
I will not do it superficially. Then will you at least cut it shorter? Our guests do not appreciate it. If it pleases you, Maharaj, I will cut it shorter. My desire to please him overshadowed any other concerns. That night, out of curiosity, I looked into a mirror. It had been a long time since I had seen my reflection or used a comb, for that matter. Hanging halfway to my waist, my mane was quite matted. The next morning, Ban Maharaj instructed Asim, Bring Ratin Krishnadas to the barber. Asim chuckled while leading me toward the barber shop. A warped and rotting wooden shack, hardly big enough for four people to sit in. As I took my seat on a heavy wooden chair, the barber gawked at my matted locks. He was a skinny little man in his mid-fifties, bare-chested, and wore only a checkered cotton cloth around his waist that extended just above his knees. How to cut such hair, he muttered. He desperately attempted with every variety of scissors he had, but none could penetrate. Finally, he called an open-air conference in the lane with other local barbers. How to cut such hair, they repeated again and again. After much deliberation, they decided to call for a gardener. The gardener arrived, a muscular, heavy-set man with a thick black mustache wearing loose cotton clothes soiled with a mixture of dirt and sweat. He evaluated my head for some time and then left for his storehouse to fetch the proper equipment. He returned with a rusted set of loppers used for cutting bushes. The tool was shaped like a gigantic pair of scissors. My haircut was becoming an elaborate project, and the gardener the self-acclaimed foreman of the site. Pointing his stubby finger, which was caked with dirt under his uncut nails, he dictated orders— Grab his hair and pull backward, he said to his assistant. Pull harder, harder. Yes, now hold it as tight as you can. Canvassing a passerby, he instructed, You hold this sadhu down on the chair and don't let him move. Then he ordered the barber, You grab the bottom of the cutter with both hands and push up. I'll push the top of the cutter down. With great seriousness, the four men assembled, each in his strategic position. The gardener and the barber strained, groaned, and perspired, using all their body weight as they pushed the cutter from both directions. Dozens of passers-by stopped to gawk at the spectacle. A few more even joined in the effort each one pushing his weight into the bush cutter. Whatever came of this one big cut would be my new hairstyle. There would be no second cut. Everyone in the crew was moaning and sweating in the struggle to penetrate my hair. Little by little, I felt the blades biting into my locks as hundreds of hairs snapped out from my scalp. The whole while, my friend Asim laughed so hard that tears streamed down his cheeks. Finally, after a very long few minutes of pushing and tugging, the two blades of the bush cutter snapped together. It was done. Strewn on the floor like trash was my precious hair. It had once represented my revolt against war, prejudice, and the superficialities of society, all my ideals that I held sacred. Now the barbers trampled it beneath their sandals with no mind. 
what little remained on my head hung just below my neck. It was perhaps the sloppiest haircut in modern history. But it was done. The gardener and the barber proudly held up a mirror. It is complete. Please see. Please see. With joined palms, I thanked them. But I preferred not to see. Back at the ashram gate, two interesting Americans appeared. One was David, a sincere and intelligent man who had recently acted as a personal secretary and friend of Alan Watts, a famous author of books that blended Eastern mysticism and Western logic. David and I instantly bonded and shared many hours of soul-searching conversation. David, like Asim, spoke from his heart and was an excellent listener. One day, five of Bone Maharaj's prominent disciples arrived from East Bengal. Their leader, Jagannath, served as both the principal of a school and the head of his town. He was tall, well-groomed, and walked with the poise of total confidence. Yet he was humble and respectful to all. Although he was older than my father, we became close friends. One morning, Jagannath and his companions saw David with a camera in his hand. Sir, please take our group photo, one said, while they all posed in front of the temple. David turned to me and whispered, There is only one more shot in the film. It's my last role. I was saving this shot for something special. What should I do? They're posing. We decided to pretend to take their photo by imitating a clicking sound as they posed. Then, without thinking twice about this deception, we went about our duties. The next day, I was taken aback to see Jagannath standing alone, silently crying. Why is he in such distress? I asked his friend. He sizzled me with his stare. Because of what you did. What did I do? I replied, bewildered. Yesterday you pretended to take our photograph while we posed. This is duplicitous. Shame on you for insulting us. I darted over to where Jagannath stood and begged forgiveness, but he said nothing. The next day, again I pleaded for him to excuse my foolishness. He fixed my eyes in his sad stare. You are a devotee of Krishna, he said. How could you treat another human being with such indignity? Don't you know that Lord Chaitanya taught us to be humble like a blade of grass and offer all respect to others? Duplicity is a terrible disease. Tears welled in his eyes as he turned his head away from me. Gazing skyward, he said, I trusted you as a devotee, but you have disappointed my expectations. Therefore, I cry. I cry for you, my friend, because you know so little. A real devotee would never treat anyone so cheaply. Then he embraced me and walked away. Pacing to the riverbank, ashamed of my insensitivity, I tried to make sense of all this. In ordinary society, I reflected, such an insignificant transgression would be hardly noticed. But in a devotional culture, soft-heartedness and integrity are held sacred. What really is the culture of devotion? It is so very subtle, but it fertilizes the field of the heart so that the seed of true love may grow. I had passed more than two months in the pleasant company of Asim, 
Krishna Das Babaji and Ban Maharaj. Ban Maharaj never pressed to initiate me. However, there was one monk at the ashram who could not tolerate that I refused initiation. One day he called me to his room and with scorn written on his face, preached fire and brimstone. Look at you, he chastised. You gave up material life to live as an ascetic. But until you take initiation from a guru, you have no spiritual life. His eyes narrowed to slits and his voice quivered. Do you know what happens to one who dies not having either material or spiritual life? I looked at him in silence. Do you know? No, I replied timidly. He sprung up from his seat and pointed his finger into my face. He becomes a ghost. I'm talking about you. You are a living ghost. If uncertain death comes, you will suffer miserably for thousands of years, wandering as a ghost. He stared at me. Why do you take our guru's mercy so cheaply? You must surrender or leave. Saddened, I looked down to the floor and replied, I'm sorry, I will go. Walking out his door, I gathered up my cloth bag and begging bowl and proceeded to leave the ashram. On the way out, I noticed Ban Maharaj sitting in the courtyard so I prostrated myself at his feet and asked for his blessings to leave. His eyes shot open with surprise to hear my words. Why are you leaving us? Maharaj, I wish not to offend you. I went on to paraphrase the sermon I had just heard. His expression soured with disgust. Who has spoken this nonsense, he asked. I informed him. Then with the tenderness of a loving father, he spoke these words. I never thought such things about you. You are a sincere devotee. I love you like my son. You have not offended me. Rather, you bring me joy. I welcome you to stay here as long as you wish. I assure you, there will never be such pressure again. I was grateful for Ban Maharaj's kindness. Still considering this episode, I felt it was time to move on. I did not wish to disrupt his disciples' minds. After all, I was still searching, and residence in the ashram was for dedicated disciples. In respect for the affection and wisdom Swami Ban Maharaj always showered upon me, I remained a few more days. Then, receiving his blessings, I departed for the forests of Brindavan. Chapter 6 To live in the lush forests of Brindavan. The river Yamuna beckoned me to her banks where once again I could live the life of a homeless wanderer, sleeping under a different tree every night. I had only the clothes on my back, two pieces of unstitched cloth, one that I wrapped around my waist to cover the lower part of my body and one that covered the upper part. Solitude was again my welcome companion. Often I slept at Chirgat near an ancient Kadamba tree. Aspirants to pure love of God had come since time immemorial to this holy site to hang token garments as a prayer-filled symbol for Krishna to steal away the cloak of their ignorance. The Kadamba tree is considered especially sacred in Vrindavan, and its blossoming flowers bring everyone joy. 
the Kadamba flower a bright golden ball about the size of a strawberry and covered with hundreds of tiny golden trumpet-shaped petals has an intoxicatingly sweet fragrance. Because these flowers resembled Sri Radha's golden complexion, Kadamba trees are very dear to Lord Krishna. Each night I would kneel under the tree at Chirghat and pray for humility and devotion. Then I would stretch my body on the riverbank, feeling the cold soil beneath my flesh as I drifted into sleep. My bedding was the sacred earth, my blanket the starry sky, and my waking call the distant ringing of temple bells. Every morning at four o'clock, I would awaken in the darkness, bow down on the riverbank in gratitude, and wade into the sacred waters for my bath. November was approaching, and the Yamuna had turned frigid. Often I stood shivering, submerged up to my neck. I recalled lyrics from a song that I had loved in my childhood. The river Jordan is chilly and cold. It chills the body, but warms the soul. Yes, I reflected, enduring difficulty for a meaningful purpose is a sublime pleasure. Dunking my entire body under the water again and again, I meditated on purifying my body, mind, and soul. Then I stood quietly under the still starlit sky, praying for a pure heart. This was my first meditation each day. I felt so close to the Lord. Afterwards, I would climb back onto the riverbank, disrobe to my loincloth, wring the water from my dripping garments, and put them back on. Sitting on the riverbank, I would again meditate on the Hare Krishna mantra while fingering prayer beads made of the wood of Tulsi. Each day began this way, an experience I prayed never to forget. One evening, as twilight dimmed into night, I sat under the sacred Kadamba tree and composed a letter to my father. It had been two weeks since I had made the riverbank my residence. My dear father, my long search has led me to Brindaban. I have at last found something that attracts my heart as pure truth. It has taken until now to find the conditions I have been seeking. In the past couple weeks, I have realized the great jewel that is to be learned in Brindaban. Believe me when I tell you that I am not here for any pleasure or leisure. I am here with all earnestness and sincerity to carry out a mission that I cannot neglect. You know, that in all my life I have never willfully hurt you. Please believe the importance of this journey to my life. Love, Richard. Vrindavan, October 1971. One quiet afternoon as I walked along the bank of the river Yamuna, little barefoot boys wearing shorts and little barefoot girls in cotton blouses and skirts frolicked, laughing with wild abandon while playing cricket with sticks and balls. Other children herded cows, buffalo, goats, or sheep with slender sticks. Women passed with baskets of grains balanced on their heads, covering their faces with their saris out of shyness as I passed. To my right, under a tree, Krishnadas Babaji was sitting, softly singing the Lord's names. Taking note of me, he patted the ground, inviting me to sit. There we watched as a boatman ferried people across the river. Then Babaji whispered, Under this tamarind tree is a favorite meeting place for Radha and Krishna. 
Intrigued, I inquired. Babaji, everyone around here loves Radha so much. Please tell me about her. His eyes filled with tears at the mere sound of Radha's name. Closing his eyes, he leaned forward and he spoke. The scriptures and saints teach us that God is one. Yet the one Lord has both a male and female nature. Krishna is the male principle and Radha is the feminine potency. In the spiritual world, the one Lord presides in these two forms. The love between Krishna, who is the beloved, and Radha, the lover, is the divine origin of all love. Babaji, I asked, How does this love between God's masculine and feminine nature relate to the love people share in this world? Krishnadas Babaji answered, Under the veil of illusion, or maya, we forget the ecstatic love for God which is intrinsic to our souls. Love in this world is only a reflection of it. We are searching for real love in so many ways, forgetting that it is within our hearts. Babaji looked so meek. Raising his white eyebrows, his voice faltered. Krishna longs to be conquered by the love of his devotee and by the supreme grace of Radha. We can realize that love. She is the compassionate nature of the Absolute and the fountainhead of all spiritual love. The mystery of Radha, the female energy of God, had both fascinated and eluded me. After all I had experienced, after all I had read, after all the sadhus I had met, nothing had prepared me for the hidden truth of yoga's greatest mystery, the mystery of bhakti or devotion. And now I was learning that the keeper of this mystery was Radha. For the first time, it began to dawn on me that these saints of Vrindavan had penetrated into the deepest, most confidential aspect of the spiritual journey. The secret? That beyond worldly pleasures and beyond the liberation of oneness with God is an eternal dance, an endless night of love, and the intoxication of one's very soul. And the one capable of giving entry into this unbearably sweet realm was Radha. It was their yearning to connect with Radha that allowed these yogis of Vrindavan to demonstrate such intense and genuine humility. By casting aside all interests in yogic powers, they seemed to be drowning in an ocean of divine love. My mind and heart were charmed by this rich theology known as bhakti, the yoga of unconditional love. It seemed to put so many of my mind's questions, both asked and yet to be asked, in a comprehensive perspective. Although still apprehensive about committing myself to one particular path, I felt a yearning brewing in my heart to follow the path of bhakti. After Krishnadas Babaji blessed me, stood up, and walked away along the river bank, I sat there staring into the river and contemplated on the secret of feminine divinity. In the Christian church, the adoration of Mary, the mother of Jesus, inspired both divine love and embittered factions. And the mystery of Mary Magdalene gave rise to secret orders, veiled symbolism, and intrigue. Many Hebrews saw Shekinah as the female aspect of God or the bride of the Sabbath, as did certain students of the Kabbalah. And within Islam, there were followers of the Sufi sect who honor the divine feminine in their reverence to Fatima. Now I was finding how from the Vedic ancient scriptural perspective,
feminine divinity has always been an accepted truth. As I looked out into Mother Yamuna, I pondered on how the nourishing, compassionate side of spirituality is often overruled by the elements of power and control. It impressed me how important it was to pay attention to the feminine aspect of the divine. About the same time I left the ashram, so did my friend, Asim. I supposed he felt stifled by the constant demands on him there and was impressed by how my life was simultaneously so strict yet so free. We often met to explore Krishna's forest home together. One sunny afternoon, while Asim and I talked under the shade of a banyan tree, we were struck by an overpowering presence. Turning, we discovered someone sitting right beside us. Where had he come from? His features looked simultaneously aged and youthful. A single garment made out of white cotton covered his upper and lower body. Semi-matted locks of hair reached below his neck. He had large eyes and a round, bearded face and beamed a boyish smile. Anyone who enters Brindaban, he said, is immediately connected to Krishna. Others worship God as a great king, but here in Brindaban, he gazed around and stretched his hand toward the forest. Krishna is at home. Here we love him as a friend, as a child, as a lover. We looked into the forest, and from a distance we saw an animal that looked like a wild, bluish cow hidden in the trees. Everything seemed so magical. We were wonderstruck. In the beginning, the man continued, we learned to love God as the all-powerful creator, destroyer, and savior. But God is also the sweetest and most perfect lover. The scripture tells that in Vrindavan, playful Krishna is the essence of all beauty and sweetness. Then rising to his feet, this sadhu, who had mysteriously appeared as if out of thin air, he said, Come, I'll show you places you will never forget. We followed eagerly behind as he strolled through the woods, along the riverbank, and from temple to temple. As we roamed, the local people and temple priests offered him honors. Where did he go? Asim asked suddenly. I looked around. The man was gone, and we were abandoned in an ancient temple. Asim inquired of an elderly priest, Do you know that sadhu who was with us? The priest's eyes widened and his mouth opened in awe. Oh, you don't know? He led us out of the crowd into a secluded chamber and whispered, That was Sripad Baba. No one knows his age or where he resides. He is a homeless mendicant and mysteriously wanders in a God-intoxicated trance. Almost every day when Asim and I were together, Sripad Baba would mystically appear. How did he find us? Never did he bother to greet us. Never did he bother to say goodbye. It seemed that his power was such that he was always there with us, either visibly or invisibly. Sripad Baba seemed to know about every hill, rock, stone, pebble, or grain of dust in all of Brindaban and its surrounding area. We wandered with him for many days and often throughout the night. One freezing winter night, as I lay resting on the riverbank, I observed Sripad Baba standing shoulder high in the frigid waters offering prayers until sunrise. One morning in an alleyway, an elderly widow dressed in a white sari greeted us. I've observed you wandering in the forest with Sripad Baba. Now you come with me. Each step she took was laborious. Her back hunched as she braced her overweight body into a bamboo cane. 
She hobbled along toward her home and told a story of Sripad Baba's obscure past. Asim translated her Hindi for me. Long ago, when Baba was a child in school, he and his friend enjoyed flying kites between their classes. Halting, her shriveled face puckered as she poked her cane onto the walkway, frowned into our eyes, and raised her voice. The teacher slapped their faces and scolded them. Her body and voice now trembled. The poor little boy was shocked. He couldn't understand what he had done wrong. He wondered why he should continue studying if his teacher, who had mastered all the very subjects he sought to learn, still did not know how to love. At that moment, he renounced both school and home to search for God. Turning a skeleton key to open the door of her brick hut, she glanced at us over her shoulder. Eventually, he became the disciple of a saint in Vrindavan. One night, together with four others, Asim and I stole away with Sripad Baba to a secluded forest. It was about 9.30, and night had already fallen. Beside me, on the bank of the Yamuna, sat a sadhu, with a hand-carved sitar strapped to his back. Sripad Baba introduced him as a master of the instrument, a pupil of the same teacher as sitar legend Ravi Shankar. Now, though, he is a sadhu. With a refined bow of his head, the sitarist greeted us, then closed his eyes. The sky appeared as black as ink behind the silver moon. Each star radiated a special glow, and all of these light-filled jewels above our heads danced on the river Yamuna's sparkling current. Nearby, hidden among the branches of a kadamba, night birds crooned, and from a distance, peacocks cawed as night-blooming jasmine perfumed the mild breeze. From all of this tranquility emerged the sweet sound of the sitar, long, weeping notes of an ancient raga harmonized with the symphony of the Brindaban forest, each note expressing to my ears the musician's yearning for God. An overwhelming experience came upon me while listening. I felt so far from Krishna. I couldn't find a trace of love in my heart. Bereft, I longed for that love, cried for that love, begged for that love. Suddenly, all of creation seemed irrelevant in the absence of that love. The sitar, too, wept and cried, perfectly articulating my aspirations. Chapter 7 Brindaban was full of miracles for me, both great and small. One morning, while walking along a forest trail, I found myself face to face with a charging bull. A cloud of dust billowed around his huge body, and he was fuming white foam. He stared at me in rage, opened his mouth wide, and let loose a chilling roar. Wildly pounding the earth, his hooves prepared to trample me. Before I could even react, he halted, cocked his head down, and then threw it upward in a sweeping motion, jabbing his horn into my belly. I gasped. I was hurled upward and flew headlong over the bull's body, then crashed to the ground. As I lay there, he impatiently scraped the earth with his hooves, snorting through his nostrils, and prepared to attack again. 
writhing in pain, I thought I was a dead man. Just then, a thin, neatly dressed elderly man wearing a Nehru hat appeared on the path. He shouted some words in the local language which induced the bull to lower its head. To my relief, the animal strode quietly away. Extending his hand, the strange man lifted me up. Are you all right? he asked. That bull was too much angry. Relieved, I took inventory of my physical condition. To my amazement, there were no injuries and my pain had vanished. As I took my first step, I cried out. A thorn had pricked deeply into my foot, causing me more discomfort than the horn of the bull. I reached down to extract the thorn, reflecting that perhaps this was Krishna's kindness, a token thorn to replace the bull's horn. I'm fine, I replied. Thank you for saving my life. I did not save you, Baba, the old man smiled. Krishna saved you. I was only his instrument. His voice wavered with emotion. All Krishna wants in return from us is our love. He turned me around, examining me for wounds and sweeping the dirt from my clothes. Where do you come from and why are you here, he asked. I explained my situation and the old man, noting the position of the sun, announced, I am late for a meeting. You may join me, if you wish. Together we passed along the sandy pathways of the forest. He removed his hat from his neatly combed white hair and said, I'm taking you to the home of a rare saint and scholar. He is unknown to the public but the spiritually elevated souls of this area revere him. I believe in English you would call him a saint among saints. We came upon a flat rock that served as a bridge for crossing over an open sewage canal. Thick, black sewage bubbled and gurgled in this three-foot-wide moat. Choking from the stench, I carefully crossed over it. Just then, a family of hogs dove into the moat and reveled about, slurping and gulping down the putrefied black nectar. Faces dripping with fecal matter, they snorted in joy. Minutes later, we were surrounded by a natural haven of greenery, aromatic flowers, buzzing bees, and trilling birds. After some distance, we spilled out into a courtyard with a small kutir, a hut for worship. Please come, my guide said, pressing my hand into his. Inside, sitting on a wooden plank, was a sadhu. Both his head and face were clean-shaven, in what I now understood as an expression of detachment from selfish pursuits. A small tuft of hair remained at the back of his head to represent servitude to God. I was to learn that he was over eighty years old. With a soft smile, he placed his joined palms to his forehead and bowed his head. We welcome you to our family. This was Vishaka Sharan Baba. An assembly of five elderly sages sat at his feet, eager to hear his every word. Vishaka Sharan Baba gazed towards me and spoke. My guide, who everyone called Panditji, translated his Hindi into English. He said, If one begs for God's love, Like a starving man for food, the Lord will bestow that rarest treasure. He took my hand. Please let me feed you. The satisfaction of his company drew me down that sandy pathway every afternoon at about four o'clock. 
Upon my arrival, Vishaka Sharan Baba, with his own hands, would offer me a straw mat to sit on and some flat homemade bread or rotis with gur, a sugar cane extract. This was the fare for the poorest people in Brindaban. His followers exalted him and were eager to arrange his meals, but he refused, longing to feel humble. Even in his old age, he begged door to door. Whatever he received, usually coarse rotis and gur, it was his joy to share with me. Although over four times my age, a saint among saints, a recognized scholar, he treated me with a compassion that left me speechless. Vishakasharan Baba had first come to Brindaban as a sadhu in 1918 and remained for the rest of his life. Little is known of his past, as he rarely discussed it. In the Himalayas, I had lived among holy men who practiced severe indifference to the world, and I witnessed varieties of supernatural powers. Vishakasharan Baba neither displayed such miracles nor tortured his body. He was just absorbed in loving service. When he spoke of Sri Radha's love and Lord Krishna's pastimes, he was like an innocent child, unaware that he had the authority of a spiritual king. In his shyness, he hid his ecstasies and served in an ordinary way. His presence drew an affection from my heart that I could not fully understand. On one occasion, I asked Vishaka Sharan Baba, please tell me whatever you feel I need to hear. Sitting on his wooden plank, he closed his eyes and entering a trance, a stream of words so relevant to my concerns, questions, and longing to embrace Krishna flowed from his mouth, and I listened while Panditji closed his eyes and translated for me. Lord Krishna's body is purely spiritual. His form is eternal, full of knowledge and bliss. The Vedic scriptures and the visions of millennia of saints all concur in describing his form in the spiritual world. Although his beauty is indescribable to the material senses, the scriptures give as close a description as is humanly comprehensible. He is the reservoir of all beauty. His complexion is bluish like a newly formed monsoon cloud with the exception of his palms and soles that are like pink lotuses. His eyes, which see everywhere, are the shape of fully blossomed lotus petals. His nose is soft like the sesame flower, his lips reddish like the bimba fruit, and his teeth like rows of pearls. His cheeks and forehead possess the beauty of full moons, his ears, which hear everything, are decorated with bejeweled earrings shaped like sharks. His hair, like radiant black silk, cascades luxuriously around his moon-like face and is ornamented by a string of tiny flowers, jewels, and a peacock feather. His neck gently swirls like the conch shell, and his every limb is softer than fresh butter, yet he may act with the power of a thunderbolt. He is unlimited and supremely independent. Through his energies, all material and spiritual worlds are pervaded, and he expands to personally reside within the heart of every living being as our constant friend and witness. He oversees the material creation, sometimes as a strict father. But in the highest realm of the spiritual world, Krishna is the supreme enjoyer. 
He shares his bliss with everyone through his playful pastimes, humorous words, and mischievous pranks. When he poses with three graceful bends and plays his flute, he mesmerizes our hearts with his all-enchanting love. In a state of bliss, Vishaka Sharan Baba went on as I listened, fascinated. And Sri Radha, he said, the Lord's feminine counterpart, has a complexion like molten gold. She is the supremely compassionate mother of all beings, and her beautiful attributes enchant even the mind of Krishna. But I feel unqualified to even begin to describe them. Her love is the all-pervading reality that charges the spiritual world with endless bliss. His enchanting description then shifted into an erudite analysis of these most personal forms of God, a perfect salve for my analytical Western mind. He said, One might think that such a description of God is anthropomorphic or trying to impose human-like qualities upon God. But to the contrary, it is humans who, in minute degree, have been blessed with qualities that originate in the Lord. As it is written in the Holy Bible, man is made in the image of God. His conception of the one God was so highly personal, not just in an allegoric or symbolic way, but as a spiritual truth far beyond our sensual or intellectual purview. The only way to access God for him was through sincere devotion. I found myself gradually gaining deeper appreciation of these people's reasons for chanting God's names, serving others with such humility, and praying to the deity. One afternoon, I found Vishaka Sharan Baba and the sages gathered around an old wooden radio with an arched top, metal knobs, and a protruding antenna. It was probably made in the 1930s, as the crackling of static boomed out, my friend, who had saved me from the bull, translated the news for me. India and Pakistan are at war. His face clouded with grief. The cruel war is raging. Bombs are dropping and thousands of troops are battling. No place is safe. The government has declared a blackout cutting electricity to protect us from night bombings. His attention was drawn again to the crackling voice of the news. America is warning all American citizens to leave India at once. I now felt more like an Indian sadhu than an American, so it hardly registered that this might apply to me. Still, News of the war would certainly intensify the worry of my parents. To assure them of my safety, I composed a letter on December 7, 1971, my 21st birthday. My family, the wars on earth are but a manifestation of the battles within man's mind. We enter into a battle zone the moment we forget the Lord. Today, there is war in Vietnam, in Israel, and now between India and Pakistan. As long as we are prisoners of our mind's passions, we are in each of these battlefields. But be assured that I am safe. Be kind, Richard. While the Vietnam War afflicted my colleagues across the globe in America, I now found myself in another battle zone. With the partition of India in 1947, a split with Pakistan had been created, 
and West Pakistan and East Pakistan were formed on opposite sides of India. On December 3, 1971, West Pakistani warplanes attacked Indian soil in retaliation for India aiding an East Pakistani party that supported autonomy from West Pakistan. Full-scale war began between India and West Pakistan. A bloody war ensued, with aggressive battles on the land, air, and sea that left thousands dead and many more injured. After 14 days, West Pakistan would surrender in defeat, and East Pakistan would become the independent nation, Bangladesh. While the war was still raging, Vishaka Sharan Baba and these old sages gathered around their radio and listened to the evening news broadcast. Tears of sympathy filled their eyes when they heard of the bloodshed. After switching off the radio, they immersed themselves in discussing the Lord and soon enough began bubbling over with joy. At the same time, they were both blissfully absorbed in a spiritual reality beyond birth and death and also distressed by the human suffering surrounding them. Vishaka Sharan Baba and his followers were teaching me the virtue of balance. It was an art that required maturity and realization. Through them, I saw that to be sensitive to the troubles of the world and the plight of others on the material plane did not mean that one had to neglect the spiritual plane. On the contrary, I saw how loving God naturally awakened the qualities of an ideal human being, one with compassion for all. Chapter 8 A pack of huge, angry monkeys growling and shrieking surrounded a recently born calf who trembled with helpless, weeping eyes. She mooed for her mother. While walking through the village, I happened to come upon this scene. As I searched for a suitable stick to help, the mother cow released a powerful cry and frantically galloped to the site. With her horns and her fearless love, she scattered the monkeys away. Now, with eyes glazed by affection, the cow tenderly licked her baby until the calf was pacified enough to suck milk from her udder. While I observed the scene, I recalled Lord Chaitanya's teaching that we should chant God's name in a humble state of mind, like a baby calling out for its mother. Coming from a background where humility was often taken to be a weakness, I seriously questioned what real humility is and how it works, not knowing that I was about to come upon an unforgettable lesson on the subject. One day, Sripad Baba led Asim and me to an ancient temple. Looking inside, we saw a cavernous hall of red stone with a towering ceiling. The temple had been abandoned long ago. In the semi-darkness, Monkeys were sleeping, and huge black bats hung upside down from the border of a dome high above, stains of their excrement spotting the slab floor. We walked past the temple, moving along a crumbling footpath that abruptly came to an end. Bordering the path was an open sewage canal about two feet wide. Shripad prompted us, laughing. Come on, I want to show you a very special temple. 
we stepped onto a single rock used as a bridge to cross the moat. Once on the other side, we found ourselves in a quaint home where children jumped and played while the mother squatted on the floor cooking over a small fire. What kind of temple could this be, I wondered. To my surprise, in a common closet, I beheld an incredible sight, an altar enthroning deities of Radha and Krishna. They stood about two feet high, Krishna of black stone and Radha of shining bell metal. They looked ancient. Oddly, the family seemed indifferent to the radiant deities gracing their home. But as we drew closer, we noticed an old man in torn cloth fanning the deities of the Lord, his eyes filled with tears of devotion. A small, thin man, in his seventies, he had soft eyes. His head and face were shaved, and he looked incredibly frail. Hurrying out of the closet, he bowed to the feet of each of his guests. On his knees, he welcomed us again and again with tears of gratitude. I am your obedient servant, he faltered. Please bless me. He gestured toward the deities in the closet. Please meet Radha and Krishna. Krishna called you here today because you are his dear friends. But as for me, I am only a tiny servant. My only fortune is to serve. Please allow me to serve you. This was my first encounter with Ganesham. As Sripad Baba told him how we had traveled so far to reach Brindaban, Gansham thrilled with wonder. Krishna has called you to cross oceans and continents from a faraway land, Ganesham said. He has been waiting so long for you, and now, now you have come. His voice cracked. Yes, now you have come. Ganesham's small, aged face looked so gentle and frail. His small, misty eyes, rounded nose, thin lips, and delicate wrinkles gave him an expression of permanent melancholy. The tone of his soft voice echoed with the same feeling. But underneath it, his heart and soul overflowed with such ecstatic love that it filled the lives of whoever came near him. Seeing us standing before his deities, Ganesham was overwhelmed with joy. I began to spend more time with this devoted man. Every morning at nine, I was drawn down that shambled footpath to his closet room temple. I found his company irresistible. Whenever I arrived, he extended the same affectionate greeting. I am your obedient servant. And he meant it. He gave everything without expectation of anything and loved doing so. I longed for this quality in myself. One morning, as Ganesham and I sat alone, I asked him how he first came to Brindaban. He bowed his head. My story is of no importance, he said. Then he gazed up in wonder. But Krishna's mercy upon a sinner is worth hearing. Softly he began to tell me how he was raised in an affluent family. When I was a young man, my family made pilgrimage to Brindavan. It was here that the net of the Lord's grace captured my heart. I had no power to go away. As he narrated his story, Ganesham shrunk in meekness. He told of how his family was aghast by his resolve to give up a promising career and stay in Brindavan. 
They threatened to cut me off from our wealth, but I was unmoved. Krishna had stolen my heart. Sleeping on the ground and daily begging for dry bread from the homes of the Brijabasis, he never once hankered after his former wealth. Instead, he said, I felt grateful to serve Krishna in his sweet home. Ganesham's dark eyes moved about like a timid child. He said, For a long time my heart yearned to worship a deity. Then came a day I will not ever forget. While sitting under a tree in a nearby garden, I etched with my finger the name Sri Radha in the dusty ground. The whole of that day, I worshipped the impression of her written name in the soft dust with flowers, songs, and prayers. Finally, at sunset, I erased Radha's name with my hand. Ganesham fell silent. Gazing at his beloved deities, he struggled visibly to restrain his emotions, and after a long pause, resumed his story. While rubbing the ground, I saw something gold where her name had been. I was intrigued. What is this, I thought? Let me come back when no one is around. Early the next morning, I dug with my hands in that spot where Radha had been present in her holy name. Ganesham now lost the battle he'd been waging to restrain his feelings. Tears streamed down his cheeks as he related in a trembling voice the tale of his love. That golden object my fingers had been led to was the top of the head of my Radha. Her deity appeared to me from the earth, and standing beside her, there, underground, was a black deity of Lord Krishna. At his base was written his name, Gopi Janabalaba, the beloved of the cowherd girls. His high voice cracked, but I had nothing, nothing. What could I possibly do for them? Ganesham gazed lovingly toward his deities and murmured, I do not know why they did so, but they put themselves under my care. So I have cared for them day and night. In the beginning, passers-by would donate some food for me to offer. For a long time, I worshipped them under a tree. Then, the forefathers of this family, feeling sympathy at seeing Radha Gopijana Ballaba without a home, offered their closet as a shelter. I've worshipped them here for over 50 years. As the weeks passed, I gained much inspiration studying the character of Ganesham. I am your obedient, I am your obedient, he would say, while trying to give me everything he had. Together, we sang for Gopijana Ballaba, or fanned them with peacock feather fans. Every day he insisted that I eat the Lord's prasadam, three brajarotis, or simple breads. Brajarotis are the most common food for the people of Brindaban. Although from an ordinary perspective, a brajaroti is nothing but a dry, flat piece of coarse unleavened bread, for those with faith, it was a priceless blessing. Grown in the soil of Brindaban, and cooked and offered to Krishna by the hands of a devotee, the brajaroti is considered a holy sacrament. With gratitude, I ate the brajarotis of Ganesham. One afternoon, while bathing in the river, 
I happened to see a familiar sadhu. Expecting to receive the customary blessings this Baba always offered, I was blindsided by the harsh reprimand he served me instead. Because of you, he shouted from the riverbank, Ganesham is starving. I don't understand, I cried out. He glared at me. A Brijabasi brings him three rotis every day. That is his only food, and every day you eat all of it. How selfish. What? I gasped while climbing up the riverbank. This cannot be. Please believe me. I never knew. The next day, Ganesham sat me down on the floor of his simple dwelling and lovingly served me the brujarotis. I pushed the leaf plate away. I'm not hungry today and will not eat, I said. Hearing my words, Ganesham was stricken with sorrow. You must eat. This is Gopi Janabalaba's food. He saved it only for you. I refused. With joined palms, trembling, he pleaded, Is it because of my sins that you will not accept my service? Please, eat my rotis. My heart was breaking. I pleaded with him, Ganesham, you're starving because I'm eating all of your rotis. I can get rotis anywhere, but you never leave here. But I have so many rotis, Ganesham insisted. There is no shortage. Again, he set the plate down in front of me. Please, I beg you to eat and enjoy. Again, I pushed it away. If you have more rotis, show them to me. No need, no need. He spoke quietly in a high-pitched voice that shook with desperation. I said, I refuse to accept your only food until you show me more. He raised his voice to meet my challenge. No need, no need. They are in that room. I jumped up and searched the room but found nothing in it. Ganesham, there are no rotis there. You have been starving because of me. Please, please, you eat these rotis. Ganesham's eyes filled with tears as he revealed his precious heart. You are Gopi Janabalaba's friend, but I am only the servant of his servants. My only happiness in life is in serving devotees. I beg you to enjoy these rotis. With palms folded in prayer, he pleaded, I beg you, do not deprive me of the single thing I live for. I cried on witnessing his selfless love. For the pleasure of dear Ganesham, I ate all his rotis. The next day, I came two hours later than usual, assuming he would have eaten his rotis by then. Ganesham rejoiced, Krishna Das, Ratin Krishna Das, you have finally come. Gopi Janabalaba has been waiting for you. I could not believe what I saw. The rotis were still on the altar. Ganesham explained, My Lord will not honor my offering until he has the company of a friend. Krishna has saved these rotis only for you. With these words, he placed all the rotis before me to eat. He said, Only when you eat will Sri Radha accept me as her servant. Again, I was defeated. One day, a well-wisher presented Ganesham new clothes. He shyly looked away from them and poured out his heart. This body accepts only the worn remnants from devotees. Ganesham only wore used cloth previously worn by a sadhu. He considered it priceless. 
another night, I found Ganesham sitting alone, singing beautiful ragas and playing a small harmonium. Absorbed in devotion, he was unaware I had entered the room. Although I could not understand the language of the song, the sweetness of his devotion revealed everything. Sometimes his voice lilted with joy. At other times, it mourned in feelings of separation from his beloved. I had been told that in his youth, he was a court musician in the palace of a king. He was so absorbed in his singing that an hour passed before he noticed my arrival. Discovering me, he radiated with joy, Krishna Das, you have come! He asked if I would help him to put his deities in a bed for the night. For fifty years he had done this every night, but now in his old age he was too weak to lift them. I felt honored to oblige. As I was departing, he inquired, Krishna Das, where will you rest tonight? On the bank of the Yamuna, where I rest every night. He held my hand and stroked my head like a worried father. But it is the freezing winter. You must sleep here tonight. But Ganesham, I sleep there every night. Tonight you sleep here, please, Ganesham said. He slept on the floor of a narrow hallway outside the closet. The family used it as a throughway in the house, stepping around him. As I lay on the floor, Ganesham placed his only blanket over me. I could not allow this to happen. Snatching up the threadbare blanket, I handed it back to him. This is your blanket. You must use it. No need, no need, he sighed in a high voice, refusing to take the blanket. You are an old man, and I am young. You must use it. I again handed him the blanket, but he jumped back. No need, no need. An argument ensued, but he insisted. I threatened to return to the riverbank. I dropped the blanket and stormed toward the door. No need, no need. He picked up the blanket. I will use the blanket. So I lay down beside him curled up to keep warm on that cold winter night and fell asleep. Sometime later, I awoke, wondering why I was so warm. I looked over at Ganesham, who was lying on the floor, trembling from the cold like a leaf in a windstorm. There was no blanket on him. I realized that he silently placed it over me when I fell asleep. Quietly, I covered him with it. As soon as the blanket touched him, he leaped and shouted, No need! No need! You are Krishna's friend! You must enjoy good sleep! Then I will go to the Yamuna, I cried out, while again storming to the door. Again he agreed to accept the threadbare blanket. But later in the night, I awoke feeling nice and warm. There was my dear Ganesham, his frail old body violently shivering in the cold. I tried again to place the blanket upon him. No need! No need! Ganesham loved to serve everyone he met. In fifty years, he never left the area around the small temple except to bring water to the Lord. Indeed, He could not dream of leaving his deities to whose service he dedicated his life and soul. Early one morning, while on my way from the river, I was surprised to see the aged form of Ganesham in a lonesome alleyway, stumbling and falling. I rushed to help him. With great Pains, he struggled to carry a bucket of water that he had collected from the Yamuna to bathe his deities. After every few steps, he stood limp in exhaustion. Ganesham, 
please allow me to carry the bucket. With a stern glance, he replied, no need, no need. I could not bear to see him toil in this way. Please, please, I am young. With no difficulty, I will have it at your temple in five minutes. You are very old and weak. It will take you half an hour. Please let me take it. That innocent smile of little old Ganesham radiated from his face as he pleaded, You are Gopi Jana Balaba's friend. You should enjoy. I am his old servant. My life is to serve. You go now and enjoy Vrindavan. That will make me happy. His humility simultaneously melted my heart and worried my mind. Please, I said, I will be most happy to carry your bucket. I gripped the handle of the bucket and pulled. Ganesham's entire body tensed like a tree, freezing with determination. He grasped that handle with all his strength. He clenched it as a man, helplessly hanging from a cliff, clings to the rope that separates him from death. His eyes searched mine in desperation. I am an old man. My only wealth is my service. His eyes grew red and swelled with tears. If you take away my service to the Lord, you will take away my life. Please allow me to live. Please. My heart sank. What else could I do? I gave him his life back and his bucket. But when he noted my anxiety for him, he consented to our carrying it together, side by side, asking me every minute if I was all right. One night, Ganesham suggested that I visit Barsana, a nearby village that was the home of Radha. He softly cried out, Krishna Das, your life will never be the same after you feel the atmosphere of Barsana. Seeing my enthusiasm, he shyly added, When you go, please tell Sri Radha that her tiny servant Ganesham wishes to see her. My heart was deeply affected by this little old man who lived in obscurity. He was not a learned scholar, a famous guru, or a mystic yogi, but he was a true saint. His humility was his expression of love for God. At one time I had thought, like many in the West, that humility was an act of self-effacement a weakness that revealed a lack of self-confidence or self-care, even a negative obsession that could lead to a sense of inferiority or depression. But I was discovering, in the company of people like Ganesham, that true humility was the opposite of that, for it connected us to an inexhaustible power beyond our own, the power of grace. True humility is a universal pride in the greatness of God and a genuine appreciation for the virtues of others. Real humility, I was finding, did not mean I ought to be cowardly and shrink from challenges, but propelled me to strive with all my resources to overcome challenges with integrity, respect, love, and gratitude to be as much as possible an instrument of the divine. In real humility, there is a deeper principle than our sad need to feel superior to others. That higher principle prevents us from being arrogant and condescending toward those we feel are inferior. It protects us from being envious toward those who we feel are more accomplished. When one is humble, one feels grateful and gives credit to the Lord and all those who have ever offered help. With a humble heart, 
one can easily admit mistakes and open one's heart to learn. Becoming humble is not the act of killing the ego, but liberating the real ego, which is eternally vibrant with love for God and love for others. The most profound mystery I was finding is that to the degree one possesses these exalted characteristics, he feels himself to be very small, a part of God and the servant of all. To selflessly serve others was Ganesham's heart's only joy. Ganesham Baba was one of the happiest and wealthiest men I had ever met. A simple man who simply loved God. Chapter 9 A black snake slithered out from under the rock where I sat, flitting its shiny tongue. Under the graying sky of evening, as mosquitoes buzzed around the bank of the river, my mind stirred. I thought, fear is a dominating force in life. Fear of disease, failure, disappointing others, or economic ruin. Fear of enemies, thieves, cheaters, or a multitude of other possibilities, including doubt in one's direction in life. Feeling a mosquito biting into my ankle, I realized that any one of these tiny insects could kill me with malaria, and I wandered about the whereabouts of that snake. Certainly, I thought, I must be realistic to protect myself, but too much fear could either stifle my progress or consume my mind with anxiety. In the arms of her mother, a baby is relieved of all fear. This faith, whether born of scientific or philosophic knowledge or simple trust, brings peace. Real faith, I thought, comes through direct experience of a higher reality or through the company of those who have attained that faith. The following adventure highlighted this truth and became another signpost on my inner journey. One day, Krishnadas Babaji, Ban Maharaj, and Asim recommended that I visit Barsana. I recalled the night when Ganesham asked me to do the same. Ganesham never asked anything from anyone. That was his nature. In his own affectionate way, I considered, he was leading me deeper into the mysteries of my path, a path that was gradually unfolding. They directed me to stay with a reclusive sage who resided in the remote rolling mountains of Barsana. This was a town dedicated to Radha, 30 kilometers from Vrindavan, and full of lakes, gardens, palaces, and palatial temples. To reach the sage, I first climbed a wide staircase that swirled up a mountain and led to a temple replete with domes, spires, and arches. My breath was taken away. The path led me through this temple into a flower-filled mountaintop garden, then through yet another palatial temple. Minutes later, I found myself on an earthen pathway, meandering through a forest inhabited by monkeys, peacocks, and exotic, trilling birds. As I walked, 
I meditated on the Hare Krishna mantra. The atmosphere, charged with spiritual grace, seemed to embrace me, and the mantra filled me. Blessed from both within and without, I fell into a beautiful state of consciousness. It was there, alone in Radha's forest, that a profound glimpse of spiritual love awakened within me. I felt my heart flooding with intoxicating nectar. Closing my eyes, which were full of tears, I felt Radha and Krishna showering their love upon me and calling me to meet them within my heart. I shivered. The forest where I stood now seemed to be in another world, billions of miles away from Earth. In gratitude, I continued slowly uttering the Hare Krishna mantra. I sensed that this was only a glimpse of divinity that would soon recede, and it created in me a longing for more. That afternoon, in Radha's forest, I realized that this longing for spiritual love invoked by the mantra itself was a fuller, deeper experience than anything I had ever encountered. Winding along the trail through this enchanted forest, in a state of joy, I approached the sacred mountain of the sage. It was now almost evening by the time I gazed up at the steep climb before me, straining I scaled the crude red rocks that served as steps to the sage's dwelling. At the top, I found a deserted-looking temple crumbling from age. For some time, I sat alone until curiosity lured me into one of the ruins. As I approached the entrance, a long snake slithered by only inches away and disappeared into a hole in the wall. I entered deeper, my eyes straining to adjust to the dark. When they did, I discovered a wooden altar holding a single faded picture. Mud plaster crumbled from the walls, revealing spots of bare brick. From the shadows, a soft voice emerged. You have been called from far away. I welcome you. I turned. Sitting in the ruins in a dark corner was a man with a shaven head, his large, round belly contrasting his slender limbs. Except for a loincloth over his groin, he was naked. Perhaps forty years in age, he looked utterly aloof as he gazed into a world that the eyes cannot see. I introduced myself and asked, Could you tell me about this place? He drifted into deep thought and closed his eyes. You have entered Mangar, the mountain of angry love. In this forest, Sri Radha feigns anger toward Lord Krishna to express her unique love for him. And he comes here to plead for that love. His eyes search deeply into mine. Love conquers the beloved. It is his own sweet will to be conquered. And when Radha is pleased by our sincerity, she too blesses us with God's love. Patting the dirt floor with his palm, he said, Come, sit down if you please. Speaking distinguished English, he introduced himself as Radha Charandas, the sage I had been seeking. But people call me Ramesh Baba, he added. We talked a bit and went outside. The sun was setting, and the sky glowed gold and crimson over the hills and valleys. As the stars emerged in the still sky and the air turned cold, about a dozen children 
from a nearby village assembled on the roof of the ruins. Small, skinny, and dressed in tattered clothing, they surrounded Ramesh Baba as he played a harmonium and sang classical ragas. When he opened his mouth, heavenly sounds streamed. The small children sang along with him, rising to their feet and dancing wildly as the music grew in tempo. One boy beat a native drum with two tree branches, while another struck a metal gong with a wooden mallet, and others jingled hand cymbals. From that lone mountaintop, under the starlit sky, they danced and sang the Lord's praises, their high voices ringing. As their enthusiasm reached a crescendo, the Baba rose from his seat to dance in a graceful trance. After the chanting swelled to its tumultuous conclusion, Ramesh Baba sat down to sing a slow, soul-stirring melody that culminated in breathtaking silence. A boy of about seven pressed his small hand into mine and led me away to the rooftop where he and his playmates had made an altar. Nothing more than a straw hut tied together with twine. Inside was a painting of Lord Krishna embracing a calf. The child's pitch black eyes glistened in the moonlight. Smiling proudly and in a voice peaking with enthusiasm, he declared, This is my God. He spoke with a certainty that left me awestruck. Playfully dropping my hand, he ran off to join his friends. I stood speechless. He had spoken from a heart that bore no malice, envy, or conceit, exhibiting the type of faith that rare souls aspire to gain through a lifetime of spiritual practice and scrutinizing scriptures. I remembered the words of Lord Jesus. Unless one becomes like this child, one cannot enter into the kingdom of God. In the presence of that child, I felt like an agnostic at best. Humbled, I stood, gazing at that picture and prayed, My Lord, will I ever be blessed with such faith? Shaki Sharan Baba, the only other soul residing on the mountain, told me about Ramesh Baba's earlier life. Ramesh Baba was born in Allahabad, the place of the Kumbha Mela. As a child, he earned distinction in the study of Sanskrit and philosophy. And at the age of 12, his voice won him the national award of the All India Competition for Music. Despite his promising future, a spiritual craving prompted him to run away from home to live as a sadhu. Each time he did so, however, a family member captured him and brought him home again. In his teens, he was such a powerful scholar and preacher that thousands flocked to hear his lectures. But he gave all that up to reside in this lonely place. Shaki Sharan said. One quiet night, as we sat by the flickering light of a lantern, I asked Ramesh Baba why he had abandoned such a successful career as an orator. His eyes rolled upward with a grimace of disinterest. Baba was not at all inclined to talk about himself. Because you have asked, he said, It is my duty to respond. He cast his eyes down. Thousands of followers were attending my discourses, but my heart yearned for the love of Sri Radha. She called for me. Baba stared into the lantern's flame, his round face illuminated by its glimmering golden light. 
So, he continued, I abandoned my growing fame as a preacher and came to Brindaban, where I found my guru at the Govardhan mountain. Then I came here. That was in 1950. I was 16. At that time, this place was a jungle inhabited by wild animals. This mountaintop, a hideout for murderers and thieves. For 21 years, I have remained here, meditating on the name of Sri Radha. Over the years, Ramesh Baba became one of the most revered saints of the Vrindavan area. He was the only son of a widowed mother who later moved into a cottage at the foot of the mountain to be near her son. She lived the life of a renounced widow, choosing a simple life, absorbed in worshiping the Lord. Since there was no electricity, plumbing, water, or food on the mountain where Ramesh Baba lived, Shaki Sharan and I would carry buckets down the front of the steep mountain to gather water from a pond. It was a strenuous climb and so taxing in the heat of the sun that we had to stop and rest every few steps. After leaving the water on the hilltop at noon, we would climb down the backside of the mountain to the small village of Manpur, where we begged door to door for food. In one home, the mother blew a conch shell, summoning her family to hasten home from the fields where they were working. Soon the family had gathered and sang a beautiful kirtan to celebrate our arrival. The father played the harmonium and led the chant while a small child, no more than ten, skillfully played upon a two-headed dolak drum. Yet another child accompanied the others with hand cymbals. All the household women clapped and sang blissfully. After 20 minutes of chanting, they placed a scripture before my begging partner and requested that he lecture. Shaki Sharan Baba spoke for about 15 minutes in the local Hindi language as the family listened in rapt attention. Then the mother filled our begging bowls with thick, coarse bridger rotis, and we returned to the mountaintop, where we shared them with Ramesh Baba, who sat on the dirt floor. But in this world, a price for being honored and loved is also to be envied and hated. A deadly gang of criminals, the local mafia, was spurred by those who despised Ramesh Baba's growing popularity and his loud chanting of the Lord's names. One quiet night, as I sat on the rooftop with him, I caught sight of the thugs, wielding guns and knives, stalking up the mountain. They stormed right up to us. I knew that in such remote places there was little regard for life or law. With savage stares, they sized us up, making it clear that they were ready to slash our throats on the spot. The leader was filthy and disheveled, big, strong, and violent. He had a black scarf wrapped around his head and had a thick mustache and rotten teeth. We are the law in these parts, he raged. Stop this chanting or you will die. To kill you will be like squashing a mosquito. Baba just sat peacefully, utterly indifferent, until the gang left. On another night, a follower of Baba's from the nearby village described the death threats his family received. I was aware that murders in these isolated forests were not at all uncommon. But Ramesh Baba was not disturbed. He told me, I am chanting God's names in Kirtan according to the saints and scriptures. 
If the Lord is pleased with me, I do not mind what they do. Baba carried on with the kirtan, unfazed. I realized that such conviction was a quality I needed to cultivate in order for my heart to be a proper vessel to receive what I prayed for. Yes, he had an ideal he was willing to live and die for. Under the starlight, we slept on a cement platform just outside the temple. One night, I took note that Ramesh Baba laid on his back with a three-foot stick by his side. Curious, I sat up. I have never seen you sleep with a stick, Baba. Is there a reason you have one now? His voice was calm. Yes, the villagers sent news that a man-eating leopard is in the area. It has already massacred some cows and villagers. Then knitting his eyebrows, he raised the stick. This evening the leopard was seen climbing our mountain. I'm keeping this stick for protection. He spoke as nonchalantly as one might talk about the weather. Wonderstruck, I asked, but what will that small stick do to protect us from a wild leopard? Nothing, Krishnadas. Only the Lord can protect us. He yawned deeply and closed his eyes, drowsily finishing his thought. However, our duty is to show Krishna that we are doing our part. Encouraged by his faith, I slept well that night, and the Lord did protect us. I stayed with Ramesh Baba on several occasions. During the hot season, Baba's mountain was burning, sometimes reaching 115 degrees Fahrenheit. The winters were equally extreme, with the temperature often dipping to frigid. Despite the severity of the seasons, with neither a fan to cool him in summer or a heater to provide warmth in the winter, Ramesh Baba was peacefully absorbed in chanting, meditating on Krishna day and night. Given that there was no plumbing, responding to nature's call meant walking into the forest with a small container of water. Squatting down, we would first evacuate and then cleanse ourselves with the water we'd brought. We completed the process by taking a full bath in the pond. In fact, throughout my travels in India, this was the sadhu's way of eliminating waste from the body. Enthusiastic hogs, the local sanitation department often appeared to devour the meal of waste. On an autumn afternoon, suffering a bout of dysentery, I squatted in the bushes in response to the screaming call of nature. Already feverish and completely exhausted by the disease, I was horrified to see an enormous snake crawl out of the bushes and slither toward me. It was about six feet long and two inches thick, yellowish with green spots. I recognized by its triangular head that it was poisonous. The reptile fixed his stony stare on me crawled right on top of my squatting bare feet and stopped, resting its chilly body. I dared not move. Holding my breath, I contemplated. Death may come at the least expected moment. Is this the inglorious way I must die? Unlike Ramesh Baba, who had no fear of death, I did. The pounding of my heart and reeling of my mind showed me how very far I had to go to be yet surrendered to the Lord. I thought back 
to the powerful current of the Ganges as it had hastened me toward my death. Here I was again. With all my heart and soul, I softly chanted again and again, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Then, just as on that day when I was being pummeled by the Ganges current, I gradually began to feel peace through the inconceivable power of the mantra, and detachment arose. I found myself able to view the snake, not as an enemy, but as a brother. In the presence of the Lord's name, all fear had dissipated. I rejoiced. Minutes passed. The serpent stared into my eyes. Then slowly, turning its head, it slithered back into the bushes. Humbled, I reflected. Today the Lord has revealed to me what a tiny child I am on the spiritual path. When a child is in danger, his only means of protection is in appealing to his mother or father. And today the mother and father of this tiny child have come in the form of their holy names to give me shelter. Each night, Ramesh Baba and I shared rotis on the dusty floor. One night, as his form shimmered in the lantern's light, he inquired, Which place in America were you brought up? A small town near Chicago, I replied. He stopped chewing, and a tear of compassion welled up in his eye. O oh, Krishna Das, Chicago is the place where cows are killed. Taking a deep breath, I closed my eyes, sadly remembering the stench and cries of the stockyards we used to pass in the car when I was a boy. Isolated as Ramesh Baba was on that solitary mountain top, and not having heard world news in decades, how did he know this? But it was true. In the past, the Union stockyards on the south side of Chicago comprised the largest slaughterhouse operation in the world and processed most of America's meat. It moved my heart to witness Ramesh Baba's compassion for the cows 10,000 miles away. Ramesh Baba became a lifelong friend and great inspiration. He lived and spoke what he believed, caring nothing for public opinion. I found it fascinating that he lived in similar conditions to the sages of the Himalayas while never leaving Vrindavan. He was a strict ascetic and profound scholar who spent his life begging and crying to be an instrument of Radha Krishna's gentle love. When he sang and when he served, that love was evident. Yes, I pondered, the path of bhakti is very deep. Kind souls like Ramesh Baba and others I have met are leading me deeper into my journey and kindling the fire within my heart to find my guru. I sincerely believed now that this teacher would be revealed to me when I was ready. Chapter 10 Children adorned with dazzling crowns, sparkling jewelry, 
and scintillating costumes perform the pastimes of Krishna on stage. Trained in the minute details of drama, they sang, danced, and acted for an audience of over a hundred enchanted locals who sat in a garden. Such theater was performed simultaneously all around Brindavan, and a Simanai would sometimes attend. On this particular day, Krishna and his cowherd friends pretended to be tax collectors and blocked the path of Radha and her cowherd girls, who carried clay pots of butter on their heads. Asim translated the local Hindi for me. The sweet little boy playing Krishna said to Radha, Before you can pass, you must pay taxes for the beauty, charm, and sweet love that you possess. The tax will be the pots of butter on your heads. The beautiful child playing Radha's friend, Lalita, replied, Why should we pay taxes to you? My Radha is the queen of Brindaban. You should pay taxes for her, for all the grass your cows eat every day. Through playful dialogue, filled with humor, joy, and spiritual emotion, the players captivated our hearts. Their classic stories enhanced by song and dance. In every encounter, Sri Radha's love won over playful Krishna. I had learned in the course of my travels how the essence of yoga meant simply to be absorbed in the Supreme. It struck me how many ways there were to be absorbed. Dawn cast its first light on a spacious courtyard behind a medieval sandstone temple. A brick wall ten feet high covered with leafy, flowering vines that hosted droning bees bordered the yard. Birds hidden in tree branches began their chorus to welcome the rising sun. The enclosure was a sanctuary where devotees prayed quietly. Previously, Krishnadas Babaji had explained to me that in the center of the courtyard was the samadhi or tomb of a renowned saint named Rupa Goswami. He and his elder brother, Sanatan, had at one time ruled Bengal under the king as prime ministers. These young aristocrats were handsome, scholarly, and owned palaces of fabulous wealth. Although charitable in every way and loved by all, they longed to give society the greatest gifts, the love of God. With this conviction, they gave away all they had in charity and moved to Brindaban, where they slept under forest trees. Under the inspiration of Lord Chaitanya, the brothers composed vast literatures to illuminate the world with the inner secrets of spiritual love while they personally exemplified those teachings. For almost five centuries, they had inspired countless followers. I had become so attracted by Rupa and Sanatan's devotion, I couldn't hear enough about them. I knelt down before Rupa Goswami's tomb and prayed silently. Above the earth where the saint's body was enshrined was a small square room made of sandstone that had a domed roof and was crowned with a spire. In my readings from religious books of various faiths, I had learned of how a saint's presence is especially powerful at his tomb. But nothing, nothing could have prepared me for what was about to unfold on that day. I suddenly experienced an invisible energy, mystical yet real, that poured out from the samadhi. It was as if a spirit that possessed limitless grace was embracing me and filling me with love. I felt weightless, beyond the body and mind. My limbs shivered and skin tingled 
as waves of gratitude thrilled my heart. Looking down at the dusty ground, I felt so small and unworthy of such an intimate experience. Was this another glimpse into the divine love that I yearned for, spurring me on to crave for more? I felt it was. My Lord was nudging me onto yet another step forward toward my destiny. I suddenly knew with certainty that bhakti was the path that I would give my life to and that Krishna's name would in time reveal his love to me. All the reservations that had prevented me from committing my whole heart to this path were now gone. But I understood that I would have to follow sincerely under the shelter of an authentic teacher or guru to whom I believed Krishna would bring me. Bhakti, the path of devotion, my path had been revealed. Finally, I accepted. I had now been in India for one year. I continued to learn the lesson that along with everything wonderful came an equal number of challenges. Months before, I had dutifully trudged to the immigration office in nearby Mathura to apply for a visa extension. The agent sent my application on to New Delhi, assuring me that in the meantime, the receipt of my application would serve as my legal visa until the official reply. The autumn was giving way to winter, and there was still no reply. At least, that's what I thought. Unbeknownst to me, a letter had been delivered to an ashram where the recipient lost it and never informed me. The letter, it turns out, had stated that I must report immediately to the office in Mathura. Unaware of any of this, I failed to report. Time passed. As a result, the immigration agent in charge of my case was outraged feeling that I had defied his authority. I, in the meantime, went about my life unaware that anything was wrong. One day, a temple priest hurried out to the street where I stood. His face was solemn. A government agent is hunting you down, he said. He believes you defied him. What are you talking about, I blurted, bewildered. What could I have done? to warrant such attention. In the morning, he came here searching for you. He screamed like a mad dog, threatening that when he found you, he would severely punish you. The priest's face twisted in disgust as he lowered his voice. I know this man. He is cruel and corrupt. We fear him more than the local criminals, for he has the power to do anything. What should I do, I inquired, my heart pounding. Be careful. Everywhere I went, people told me that the agent had been there searching for me. Dozens of Brijabasis and sadhus prayed for my protection. In those days, along with Sripad Baba and Asim, I would sometimes visit the second home of an affluent woman from Delhi named Yogamaya. She had a two-room apartment where nightly she hosted devotees to perform kirtan while she cooked for everyone. One such night I met a man from New Delhi called Engineer. A mechanical engineer by profession, he was a tall, middle-aged man with neatly combed black hair and a trimmed mustache, and like everyone else at Yogamaya's place, he was a gentle soul and a sincere devotee of Krishna. After hearing my case, he assured everyone that through his connections, he would try to normalize my immigration status in New Delhi. Everyone at the house insisted that the two of us leave at once. Under the cover of night, 
engineer and I crept along the small lanes of Brindaban to reach the bus station. As we stood in line to purchase our tickets, a voice resounded like a crash of thunder. Arrest him! A hush fell over the bus station. Before I could understand what was happening, a hand seized my neck and slammed me against a brick wall. I was face to face with the government agent. You defied me, he blasted. Now you are mine. His eyes flashed with rage. Engineer tugged at his sleeve, trying to explain the miscommunication, but the agent was not a man to listen to reason. He was a man of force. He struck Engineer across the face again and again, then pinned him against the wall next to me. You dare to challenge my authority, he screamed. If you speak another word, you too will be beaten and arrested. Women screamed, men gasped, and children cried. Two police constables flanked him, holding clubs to prevent anyone from interfering with him. As Engineer cowered against the wall, the agent gripped my neck and dragged me away. The local people looked on in horror, crying, He's a sadhu. Do not hurt him. Do not hurt this boy. The agent yanked me along and shoved me into the bus bound for Mathura. At the door of the bus, he turned to the two constables. Away with you. I don't need your help. This culprit is all mine now. He ran me down into the front seat and sat beside me. I got a good look at him now. He was built like a warrior with disheveled hair and short beard. Shaking my shoulders, he screamed into my face. I'll whip you, starve you, and make you wish you were never Born, spittle shot from his lips. Wiping his spit from my face, I thought, I'm in the hands of a sadist. This man is mad. What can I do? I closed my eyes and softly chanted the mantra. The overcrowded bus jerked forward. We drove along for a while when suddenly chaos erupted in the rear of a bus. A fight had broken out between two farmers. My captor seized this opportunity to display his prowess. He leapt up from his seat. He ordered the bus driver to watch over me, as if I could go anywhere with the bus speeding down the highway. Roaring, the agent rushed to the back of the bus, knocking everyone aside. At the rear, he dove into the brawl and mercilessly thrashed the two farmers. Meanwhile, I thought to myself, the next few seconds may be my only chance to escape. Inwardly, I cried out for direction. An idea popped into my mind. I sprang from my seat and rushed to the driver, crying out, Pani, 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 meaning I had to pass urine. With a wave of his hand, he ordered me back to my seat. But to his dismay, I didn't leave. Instead, I jumped up and down, holding myself like a little boy, screaming out with the pangs of a burning, bursting bladder. Pani, Pani! Again, he ordered me to sit. At that moment, I took note that the driver was barefoot. This was my only possibility to escape, and it was passing. What I did next should be understood as a radical measure in a time of great emergency. I squatted down beside the driver's seat and passed urine onto the floorboard of the bus, carefully aiming it so that the stream would ricochet onto his bare feet. Feeling my warm urine sprinkling upon his feet, his eyes flung wide in shock and his mouth gaped open, Utterly bewildered, he slammed on the brakes, cranked open the door, and screamed, Do it outside! I ran like the wind. To my surprise, the bus drove off. I guess that bus driver wanted to be rid of me forever. In a field, I watched from behind a bush. Fifty yards down the road, the bus came to a screeching halt and backed up. 
I could just imagine my captor smacking the driver for setting me free. The agent burst out into the darkness of night and searched frantically up and down the road with a flashlight in hand. But all he found was an isolated highway. Frustrated, he stomped back onto the bus and returned to Mathura. Meanwhile, I slinked through fields, forests, and back alleys to reach Yogamaya's house. Engineer was there. He had already narrated my capture to the devotees. They, in turn, had been praying and chanting all night for my protection. They did not know what else to do. When I entered the doorway, everyone leaped up to greet me. How did you escape? they asked in unison. By Krishna's mercy, I was ashamed to describe my unconventional methods. Later, other passengers who were on the bus related to me the events that followed my escape. The agent had blazed in rage. An old widow ridiculed him. You boast to be such a big, tough man. Ha, ha, ha. But now you have been defeated by that skinny little sadhu? Everyone in the bus roared with laughter. Utterly humiliated, he publicly declared to avenge the wrong I did to him. From that night on, he dedicated his time to hunting down his prey, me. The Brijabasis gave him wrong leads. Meanwhile, I learned every back alleyway in Vrindavan, daring not to step on the main road. I lived like a fugitive with an obsessed agent of the law hot on my trail. One morning at 4.30, as I prayed in the Radharaman temple, I presented my case before Krishna. If I try to leave India with an invalid visa, I will never be allowed to return. If I stay, it is only a matter of time before I'm apprehended and then deported from Vrindavan forever. Please do to me whatever you wish. In the darkness of the early morning, I left the temple and paced along a narrow lane. Suddenly, an eerie howl rang out in the dark. I hesitated in my step. Horror struck, and the fangs of a beast plunged into my right leg. Gripped by the formidable jaws, I was dragged to the ground. Then it was over. I looked back and saw only darkness. The creature had disappeared into the night just as quickly as it had appeared. My leg was burning with pain. I limped forward in the shadows, lost my balance, and stumbled into a canal where I lay in thick black sewage. I hauled my body up out of that mess and hobbled on to the Radha Balaba temple, where I was warmly greeted by the chief priest and his son, Radheshlal Goswami. They arranged for me to bathe. In their affectionate company, the pain of my leg began to seem irrelevant. Later that morning, as I sat with Ganesham and two other sadhus in his temple, Ganesham noticed my leg bleeding. Startled, that lovable old man raised his eyebrows and asked in a high pitch, Krishna Das, what happened to you? I explained. They shook their heads in grief. An elderly sadhu gasped. Any mad dog that bites like that has rabies. You must immediately take treatment. Dejected, I replied, Better that I die in Brindaban than get sent away. Their bodies swayed restlessly and they looked to me like beggars pleading for food. They said, Rabies makes you raving mad. We insist you must take proper treatment. The free medical stall was a wooden shack right on a main road. With the agent hunting for me, it was especially dangerous for me to be there. 
but I took my chances anyhow. Dozens of poverty-stricken people stood in line. Flies swarmed, buzzing and biting. The doctor had a terribly limited supply of medicine. I carefully observed how he gave a diseased person an injection, swished the needle in a cup of alcohol, and then used it for the next person, and the next person, and the next. Then came my turn. The doctor analyzed my wound and frowned in dismay. He exclaimed, You must have rabies. Can you identify the animal that bit you? Doctor, it disappeared in the night, I answered. I don't know what it was. He made me lie on my back on a bare wooden table. Scrambling through a metal box, he lifted out a huge needle. It was tarnished and bent. Before my eyes, he sharpened it with a file. Slowly, he drew the serum into the syringe. He said, Forgive me, but I must inject you in the stomach. This will be very painful. The doctor pushed the dull needle into my stomach, but it would not penetrate. He tried again and again, struggling to dig it deeper as I lay there squirming, visibly frustrated as dozens of impatient, sick people waited in line. He cried out, If I don't get this serum in you, you will die. In an emergency, sometimes we must abandon conventional techniques. In a passion, he thrust that needle down into my stomach with great force and my whole body bounced from the table. It was excruciating. Finally, the needle penetrated. I felt like it was ripping me in two. The doctor slowly pushed the serum through the muscles and into my bloodstream. My stomach swelled in agony. I was desperate to get out of that place and never come back. As I staggered away, he announced, you must return for the next 13 days to receive these injections. I knew it was not possible for me to survive another such ordeal. It's not possible for me to return, I said. If you don't, you will go mad with uncontrollable convulsions and die. I explained my complex situation. If I come on this main road every day, I will surely be imprisoned. As we spoke, he grew affectionate and assured me, I am a government doctor. I will write a letter with government stamp. You take it to Delhi, and they must give you a valid visa. The next day, my stomach was bruised with purple and green swelling. There would be no reprieve, however. The same painful ordeal had to be repeated for another 13 days, no matter what. The poor doctor was earnestly trying to do the best he could with what he had. He promised to have a better needle when I returned. As he'd instructed, I boarded a third-class train to New Delhi. When I reached the home minister's office, I was given over to a high-ranking official, as mine was a special case. The official gravely read the doctor's note, which stated that I had rabies and would die without proper treatment. The doctor went on to request urgently that I be granted a valid visa so that he might continue my treatment. Done reading, the immigration official looked sternly into my eyes. Then he spoke. I will not be able to sleep at night if I know that I am the cause of your death. He called for my files to be brought in and with great care regularized my immigration status. Now you are completely legal. 
There is no longer any problem. With these words, he stamped my passport with a fresh visa. I returned to Brindaban, feeling that I had passed through another necessary purification to prepare me for my destiny. I was not to be bothered by the government agent again, as he was now under investigation and soon to be fired for abuse of power. I was free to stay in this place I loved and had an overpowering sensation that something wonderful would soon unfold for me here. One chilly night during the last days of November, I sat alone under a kadamba tree on the bank of the river where I carefully listened to the quiet, swishing song of Yamuna. The moonlight glimmered on the surface of the water while birds of the night filled the air with soothing sounds. My mind became a projector and the river a cinema screen on which I observed the events of my life. I witnessed the joys and sorrows of my childhood and the senseless escapades of my teens. I saw Gary and myself charged with the energy of youth leaving our homeland to seek meaning. We had roamed Europe, seeing the sights, making friends, and soaking in every possible experience. The one constant through it all had been a longing for God, which became an obsession. Where did this longing come from? I did not know. Searching, I had studied religions and philosophies and from childhood had prayed in synagogues and later in monasteries, cathedrals, mosques, and temples. Gazing into the current, my mind flowed back to that fateful sunset on the island of Crete where I resolved to embark upon my pilgrimage to India. Life-changing lessons had greeted me as I crossed the Middle East. While studying the Holy Quran, danger and disease perpetually hovered over my head. As I looked deeper into the river, my mind's eye beheld the panoramic beauty of the Himalayas. I envisioned the great rishis mystics, ascetics, yogis, and lamas from whom I had so eagerly learned. They had all been so kind to me, and in my heart I thanked each of them. Then I witnessed the miraculous reunion with Gary in that rice paddy in Nepal. I wondered where he was now and why we'd been separated again. On that riverbank, I heard again all the unceasing prayers that I had offered on my arduous pilgrimage, praying that my spiritual path be revealed. I recalled how Lord Rama had appeared in Ram Sevak Swami's dream and said to him, This young boy is a devotee of Krishna, and Vrindavan will be his place of worship. At that time, I had disregarded those words. But now, having resided in Brindaban for about five months, I had a sense of sincere surrender and had finally accepted devotion to Krishna as my spiritual path. Still, emptiness lingered within. I knew that I must accept a guru to whom I could fully dedicate myself. This necessity was emphasized both by tradition and by the words of scripture. To harmonize one's life in the service of a guru's teaching was the path that enlightened souls had followed since time immemorial. Gazing into Yamuna's dark current, I prayed for direction. It was now late at night. With these thoughts in my mind, I lay down to sleep 
on the river bank, only to be haunted by a strange dream. I found myself in a comfortable house in America, surrounded by people chattering on about frivolous topics while a television droned in the background. I awoke with a start. Why did I leave Brindaban? I shouted, confused. I rolled about on the riverbank, sobbing into the darkness. Why did I leave Brindaban? Why did I leave Brindaban? Gradually, I recognized the Yamuna flowing by and the nearby Kadamba tree. I am in Brindaban, I exulted. I am still in Brindaban, I said aloud. I pressed myself to the cold earth beneath me, feeling that I never wanted to leave. After regaining my composure, I reflected. This cold, dusty riverbank in Brindaban is many times more precious to me than a palatial mansion in the country of my birth. Later in the morning, as I walked along a narrow lane, I stepped around a cow stretched out lazily in my path. When I looked up, I saw a western monk dressed in saffron robes eagerly approaching and waving his arms as he called out, Richard, Richard. It seemed I knew this person. As he drew nearer, I saw that he was a devotee I had met nine months earlier at the Hare Krishna festival in Bombay. I had never seen one of these Western-born disciples of Srila Prabhupada in Vrindavan. I was delighted. Srila Prabhupada is coming tomorrow, he exclaimed. The sun was about to set. Chattering birds frolicked in the sky. A cow rose lazily from its slumber and, clacking her hooves on the footpath, strode away with a gentle moo. A strange feeling of excitement rushed through me as he continued, Did you know that Srila Prabhupada is a resident of Brindaban? He's returning after spreading the culture of devotion all over the world. Patting my back, he smiled. Prabhupada will be so happy to see you here. We were all wondering where you could be. Please, come. Chapter 11 It was November 26, 1971. I stood on the side of a road as an Indian-made bus rattled into Brindaban. It came to a halt. The door swung open and out stepped a small elderly man dressed in saffron robes and carrying a wooden walking stick in his hand. Srila Prabhupada, I would learn, was Brindaban's ambassador to the world. From the four directions, both young and old rushed to greet him. Seeing the man who had once showed such kindness to me, I melted with joy. What followed invoked cheers from the locals. Out from the same bus came forty Krishna devotees, women and men, from a mix of nationalities and races, European, American, Latin, African, Asian, and Indian. It was the first time in history that such a large crowd of foreigners had come. As they got down from the bus, priests and pilgrims marveled in joy. Children smiled in fascination, while farmers looked on in disbelief. Krishna is worshipped by hundreds of millions of Indians, and Brindaban is their holiest place of pilgrimage. The hearts of the people of Brindaban swelled with pride to witness people of races they had never seen before sharing what they held 
most dear. A ceremony began during which dignitaries, including the mayor, government officials, priests, and religious heads, welcomed Srila Prabhupada back home. That elderly sadhu, who had departed from Brindaban penniless, with only a dream, had now returned as a world-renowned teacher. Srila Prabhupada was born a Bhai Charan to a deeply religious family in Calcutta in 1896. I had read while in Bombay that in 1922 the young Abhai met his guru, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati. At the time of their first interaction, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati told him, You are an educated young man. Why don't you teach the message of Lord Chaitanya throughout the world? Abhai couldn't believe what he was hearing. They had not even met, yet this sadhu directed him in a life mission. At that time, Abhai was actively involved in Mahatma Gandhi's independence movement. Who will listen to our message? Abhai countered. How can we spread Indian culture if we are under British rule? Srila Bhakti Siddhanta replied, Whether one power or another rules is a temporary situation. The eternal reality is that we are not these bodily designations, but the soul who is eternal and full of bliss. Real welfare work, whether individual, social, or political, should help a person to reestablish his eternal relationship with the supreme reality, Lord Krishna. Hearing Bhakti Siddhanta cite from scripture, With both logic and compassion, Abhai was convinced. In his heart of hearts, he accepted Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati as his spiritual master and entered into that order with his life and soul. My old friend, someone boomed out. I turned to find a smiling white man, slightly hefty, with flashing green eyes, shaved head, and white robes running toward me with raised arms. It was Gurudas, that boisterous soul who nine months before in Bombay had brought me on stage to first meet Srila Prabhupada. He embraced me. We meet again in this holy place, he said. Later that day, he led me through a series of lanes through the arched gateway of a medieval temple and into a small room where he told me about the life of Srila Prabhupada. In 1954, he said, Srila Prabhupada came to reside as a renunciate in Vrindavan. In this small room where we sit today, he lived a secluded life for six years, preparing for what was to come. As I pressed my body against the earthen floor, my eyes scanned the tiny room. A slender green lizard of about eight inches with a long wagging tail let out a croak, then raced across the clay-covered brick walls. A low table and wooden bed with crisscross rope for a mattress were the only furnishings. Right here, Gurudas continued, he translated the Sanskrit scriptures into English. I nodded, encouraging him to tell me more. He continued, In 1959, he took the vows of a Swami and was awarded the title A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami. Gurudas said, At the age of 69, in 1965, He left his home in Brindaban to fulfill his life's mission. With less than seven dollars and a complimentary ticket, he boarded the Jaladuta, a cargo ship to America. He sailed over rough seas, suffering 
two heart attacks and his 70th birthday on the voyage before arriving alone, docking first in Boston and then sailing on to New York City. A cool winter breeze drifted in from the courtyard outside, while as part of a ceremony, temple bells clanged and priests used wooden mallets to bang on brass gongs. Bong, 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 bong. While crowds of people thronged the temple courtyard for the ritual. Guru Das continued speaking. Arriving at the New York Harbor, Srila Prabhupada didn't know a single soul. He struggled alone, living on the Bowery and the Lower East Side, until gradually his lovable qualities and vast knowledge attracted sincere seekers of the counterculture. He transformed the hearts of many American and European youth. In 1967, I became his disciple in San Francisco. We affectionately called him Srila Prabhupada, which means at whose feet great masters will sit. After only a few years abroad, he had established a worldwide movement, and now, for the first time, he's bringing a group of his eager disciples back to his home, Vrindavan. I shook my head in wonder at Srila Prabhupada's journey. Though I too had traveled through foreign lands alone, with no money, and knowing no one, I had been 19 years old and in good health when I started. He began his journey at the age of 70 and traveled through foreign lands with no money, knowing no one, and all to be an instrument of the Lord's compassion. That evening, I returned to the temple to hear Srila Prabhupada speak. In an overcrowded hall, with rattling ceiling fans spinning overhead, I sat on the floor, waiting. Through the window could be heard a chorus of trilling and warbling birds as the assembly sang devotional hymns. Upon Srila Prabhupada's entrance, a tranquil silence descended on the room. Disciples bowed, old friends embraced him, and guests stood in awe. He was dressed in the saffron robes of a swami, perfectly clean and neatly arranged. He sat cross-legged at the far end of the hall on a red upholstered dais. The sunset shone through many windows, bathing his dark golden complexion with soft rays. His deep brown eyes, although old and wise, glittered with the innocence of a child as he gazed affectionately at each and every member of the audience. He was quite small in stature, perhaps five feet five inches, but his presence was immense. With his hands in a prayerful gesture, he bowed his head to welcome us, then cleared his throat. He spoke with a deep voice into a microphone. The basic principle of the living condition is that we have a general propensity to love someone, he began. No one can live without loving someone else. This propensity is present in every living being. The missing piece, however, is where to direct our love so that everyone is included and can be happy. He paused and looked out at the audience thoughtfully. At the present moment, human society teaches one to love his country or family or his personal self. But there is no information on where to direct the loving propensity so that everyone will be happy. His voice cracked with heartfelt emotion. I sensed that he was not just teaching, but 
pleading with each member of the audience to understand the urgency of the message he carried. Here was a man who deeply cared, and the entire audience clung to his every word. He continued, We have failed to create peace and harmony in human society, even by such attempts as the United Nations or our economic and scientific progress, because we have missed the point. Closing his moist eyes and briefly entering into a trance, he seemed to be feeling the suffering of the entire world. That missing point can be found in awakening our original love for Krishna. If we learn how to love Krishna, then it is easy to immediately and simultaneously love every living being. It is like pouring water on the root of a tree. All parts of the tree are nourished. Or supplying foodstuff to the stomach. All parts of the body are nourished. When we are situated in that position, we can enjoy a blissful life. I was so intensely focused on my spiritual search at that point in my life and the urgency with which he begged us to revive our lost love for God affected me profoundly. The devotees invited me to stay in a house with them, but I felt awkward. I preferred resting under the trees on the bank of the Yamuna, but each day After my early morning bath and meditations, I walked in the quiet dawn to hear Srila Prabhupada's morning lecture. Although I was somewhat skeptical about his disciples, thinking it odd, for example, that some carried cameras and tape recorders, something I had never seen any sadhu do, I was becoming more and more impressed by Srila Prabhupada's knowledge and personal qualities. He had an art of explaining even intricate philosophical points with simplicity and ease. And after the class each morning, Srila Prabhupada would personally take us on a tour of Brindavan. While walking with him, I saw the same places I had seen many times. But in his company, I experienced realizations like never before, as if a deeper level of reality was being revealed. When he told the story of a place, it was as if I could see with my eyes what he described. After lunchtime, I would sit in his room for several hours as he informally conversed with guests. Feeling extremely shy in his presence, I asked no questions, but was content just to listen. One such afternoon while sitting in his room, I found myself the target of a leading disciple's rebuke. This meeting is for guests only, he said. Please get out of here. All devotees are to perform their duties now. That is the rule. Although I did not have a shaved head like all the other disciples, I was the only Westerner in the room. Evidently, this man did not see me as a guest. I held a lock of my hair between my thumb and forefinger and shook it gently. But please see, I said, I am not a devotee. Visibly annoyed, the disciple looked to Srila Prabhupada for direction. I anxiously awaited the verdict, wanting very much to stay. Srila Prabhupada lifted his eyebrows smiled at me and laughed heartily. He is not a devotee. Let him stay. The disciple left 
in defeat. Then with a serious but modest expression, Srila Prabhupada said to me, I appreciate your eagerness to hear. My heart was melted by the intimacy of the exchange. Another day I happened to meet Krishnadas Babaji on the road. Hare Krishna, he greeted me. And after returning his greeting, I informed him that Srila Prabhupada had come. His face lit up. Wonderful! Please take me to see my dear God brother. Together we strode through the lanes, hurrying around honking rickshaws and water buffalo sleeping on the road. After climbing a flight of steps, we entered the door of Srila Prabhupada's room. Sitting on the floor behind a low table, Srila Prabhupada was speaking to a dozen guests. When we entered, and the eyes of these two great souls met. Their faces blossomed with joy. Krishnadas Babaji erupted into smiles. Hare Krishna, he exclaimed. Srila Prabhupada beamed with a bliss I'd never seen on any human face. A broad smile radiated, and his eyes gleamed with tears. He too cried out, Hare Krishna, and leaped from his seat to greet Babaji. Both rushed to embrace, tears of happiness filling their eyes. Srila Prabhupada then escorted Babaji to sit on the same cushion as he. For the next hour, they filled the room with laughter as they conversed in their native Bengali language, oblivious to all others in the room. Sitting only a few meters away, I observed bubbling over with excitement. What an incredible spiritual relationship these two men had. Never had I seen such love and honor between two human beings. I felt I had received a glimpse into the spiritual world. Only a couple of days passed when several of Srila Prabhupada's disciples pressured me to make a commitment. It is wrong for you to be living in Vrindavan, they said. You should join our movement and travel with us. Although I was accustomed to dealing with such pressures, I was not happy with it. If ever I were to commit myself to a teacher, which I wanted to do with all my heart, the decision would have to be impelled by deep faith in inspiration, not by anyone's pressure. One afternoon, I rushed to a garden where Srila Prabhupada was scheduled to speak, but I was late. I found myself amid grazing cows. Leafy trees swarmed with sweetly singing birds, and a crowd of native Brijabasis gathered under the warming winter sun. Srila Prabhupada was just departing, and hundreds of people were lining the path, bowing down to him as a gesture of respect. I was among them. As I lifted my head from the sandy earth, I found his feet, covered with simple canvas slippers, planted just inches from my face. On my knees, looking up, I was face to face with Srila Prabhupada. His demeanor was grave. He asked, How long have you lived in Brindaban? My mind squirmed, fearing that he too would chastise me for living here. I replied, About six months, Srila Prabhupada. His large, dark eyes gazed down into mine. It was as if nothing else existed but that gaze. I felt that he knew everything about me, my strengths and weaknesses, virtues and faults, all I longed to achieve and all I prayed to be rid of. I was speechless. Perhaps a minute passed in this way. Then, before my eyes, his face blossomed into a munificent smile. 
Very good, he said, rubbing my head affectionately. Then he continued, Brindaban is such a wonderful place. In his glance, and in this briefest of exchanges, I experienced the love of an eternal friend, a benevolent parent, and of God. Turning slowly, he walked away down the path, his wooden cane tapping the ground with each step. I closed my eyes and pondered. He is such a busy man with tens of thousands of people the world over waiting for a moment of his time. Why did he stop for me? I have nothing to offer. I am just a penniless nobody who sleeps under a tree. That small gesture had a profound impact on me, more than many of the miracles I had witnessed. It was an impact I could neither understand nor explain. Perhaps, I thought, the miracle of being an instrument of kindness is the most powerful of all. For some time, I had been troubled by a fundamental philosophical dispute over whether God was ultimately impersonal or personal. On the one hand, I had heard some yogis and philosophers profess that ultimately God is impersonal and formless, but that he accepts a temporary material form as an avatar when he descends into the world for the benefit of all beings. After accomplishing his mission, he again merges into his formless existence. All form and personality, according to the impersonalist, is a non-permanent product of material illusion. In the final state of liberation, the soul sheds its temporary identity and becomes one with God, merging into the all-pervading spiritual existence. On the other hand, I had heard other yogis and philosophers profess that God is the supreme person, that his spiritual form is eternal, full of knowledge and bliss. At the time of liberation, the soul enters into the kingdom of God where it eternally serves the all-beautiful personality of God in pure love. I often pondered this apparent contradiction. How could they both be correct? God must ultimately be one or the other. Either he must be ultimately impersonal or personal. Out of respect for my beloved teachers, it had been difficult for me to think that any of them were wrong. Some attacked the opposing point of view, while others refrained from argument by keeping the subject vague. I found that many spiritual teachings were similar until they came to this point. I thought, what is the goal I should aspire to? Should I strive to transcend dualities, to become one with an impersonal, formless God? Or should I strive to purify my heart to serve a personal Lord with unconditional love in his eternal abode? One afternoon, a guest asked Srila Prabhupada this very question. Is God formless and impersonal? Or does he have form and personality? The chattering of birds, screeching of monkeys, and honking of distant rickshaw horns were silenced by the anticipation in my heart. I sat up with attention, eager to hear his answer. Srila Prabhupada slowly leaned forward, his face perfectly relaxed, 
and his full lips curved downward at the edges. Sitting cross-legged on the floor, his elbows rested on the low table in front of him, and his hands were clasped together under his chin. With a grave gaze, he quoted from the Vedas and explained, We must first understand the inconceivable nature of God. The Supreme Lord is simultaneously personal and impersonal. It is an eternal truth that he is both formless and that he has an eternal, blissful form. I felt a warm, peaceful sensation flood my chest. With one hand, Śrīla Prabhupāda stretched his index finger upward. The Lord's impersonal, all-pervading energy is called Brahman, and Bhagavan is the personal form of God, who is the energetic source and never under the influence of illusion. Take, for example, the sun. The form of the sun as a planet and the formless sunlight can never be separated as they exist simultaneously. They are different aspects of the sun. Similarly, there are two different schools of transcendentalists who focus on different aspects of the one truth. The impersonalists strive to attain liberation into the Lord's impersonal, formless light, while the personalists strive for eternal, loving service to the Lord's all-attractive form. There is no contradiction. Similarly, the soul is part and parcel of the Lord, simultaneously one with God and different from God. Qualitatively, we are one with God, being eternal, full of knowledge and full of bliss. But quantitatively, we are always a part, just as the sun ray is but a tiny part of the sun, and yet has the same qualities as the sun. We are both one with God and different from God. God is the independent controller, but when the soul misuses his God-given independence, he forgets his relation to the Lord and falls into illusion and subsequent suffering. Leaning back against the wall, he tilted his head slightly and gazed directly into my eyes. He continued, The two schools, personalists and impersonalists, both approach different aspects of the one God. He went on to explain how Krishna, his form, qualities, personality, and abode were unlimited, and that all the true religions of the world worship the same one God. He had simply revealed himself in different ways at different times. How beautiful! With these simple and intelligent words, Śrīla Prabhupāda had harmonized two apparently opposing views. As I listened to him, tears of appreciation welled up in my eyes. Yes, now it all makes so much sense, I thought. A dilemma that had confused my progress was now completely removed. A spontaneous, joyous smile stretched across my face. Śrīla Prabhupāda reciprocated with a smile, too, one endowed with both wisdom and serenity. One guest asked him, Are you the guru of the world? Śrīla Prabhupāda meekly bowed his head and cast his eyes towards the floor. And then he said with a soft voice, I am everybody's servant. That's all. I found a special charm in this exchange. Śrīla Prabhupāda 
was so unpretentious, so free and comfortable in all that he did and said. I recall the humility of dear Ganesham, who had lived in a hallway outside a closet for 50 years. Srila Prabhupada was a learned scholar, eloquent orator, and powerful yogi who had founded a worldwide society with thousands of followers. Dignitaries came to honor him daily. Still, that natural spirit of humility was present, thinking, I'm small. God is everything. Paradoxically, that humility empowered him with unlimited confidence and determination. After the meeting, I stood up and offered Srila Prabhupada a rose. He smelled it and graciously bowed his head. Departing from the house, I wandered back to the Yamuna, elated. Prabhupada's words had put the puzzle of personalism and impersonalism together, piece by piece. And in so many other ways, he had impressed me deeply. But who is this amazing man, I wondered? What is he like as a person? Chapter 12 In December, the days were growing shorter and by late afternoon the temperature dropping. As I wrapped a cloth over my head and started down the pilgrim's path to the river Yamuna, the life of the forest stirred around me. Birds and peacocks warbled their evening songs. Farmers returned from the fields and Brijabasi women clad in orange, green, and yellow saris glided along the path with huge pots of water balanced on their heads. Suddenly, I spotted a familiar figure ahead. It was Shamsundar, the devotee who had fed me spiritual food in Amsterdam and taken such an interest in my well-being in Bombay. Even from behind, I recognized this tall American, who served as Srila Prabhupada's personal secretary. His right hand was buried in a bag of beads, and he was chanting as he advanced toward the river. I quickened my pace to catch up and shouted his name. He turned to look, and a smile of recognition flashed across his face. Ah, Richard, or what do they call you now? Some people call me Krishnadas. He wrapped his long arm around my shoulder and pulled me close. So, Krishnadas, I hear you've been living in Brindaban for a while. It's so great to see you again. We stood for a moment on the path, exchanging pleasantries. Something told me that this man, in time, would come to own a special corner of my heart. It seemed as though I had known him forever. Srila Prabhupada likes you very much, he volunteered. He often asks about you. I replied, You are very fortunate to be so close to him. And every day, too, I can't even imagine. Yeah, he laughed modestly. Sometimes I pinch myself to see if I'm dreaming. You know, I've been around him for nearly four years now. And he seems, he just seems to get younger and more beautiful every day. He's always fresh, and I've never even seen him sleep. Do you remember the first time you saw him, I asked? I was eager to hear as much about Srila Prabhupada as I could, and to understand how others had decided to change their lives so radically to follow him. 
on the riverbank, sitting cross-legged, Shamsundar rocked slowly back and forth. He said, It was in Haight-Ashbury, San Francisco, January 1967. My friends and I put together this big rock and roll dance at the Avalon Ballroom. We called it the Mantra Rock Dance. Everyone was there to welcome the Swami to the West Coast. The Grateful Dead, Janis Joplin, Jefferson Airplane, Canned Heat, Quicksilver, and Moby Grape, they all played. Even Allen Ginsberg, Timothy Leary, and Ken Kesey were there. All the hippie heroes came. Shamsunda became excited and his body rocked faster. Picture this scene. The whole place is pulsating with strobe lights and rock and roll, packed with wild, long-haired kids, most of them on acid. Then, about midnight, Srila Prabhupada walks quietly onto the dark stage and sits down cross-legged on an elevated seat. The place falls silent. Srila Prabhupada begins humbly chanting the Hare Krishna mantra. A spotlight finally locates him, and gradually the crowd joins in the chanting. Then one by one, the rock groups come on stage to join him, and the rest is history. For two hours, Srila Prabhupada led the most incredible kirtan you can imagine. When he danced with his arms upraised, he won the hearts of thousands. Or, as he put it later, I have turned hippies into happies. I tried to imagine Srila Prabhupada living in Haight-Ashbury, the world capital of the hippie culture. Gary and I had spent some time there in 1968. From what I remembered, it was like a universe unto itself, filled with peace-loving hippies, starry-eyed seekers, drug dealers, junkies, tourists, entrepreneurs, and hell's angels roaring up and down Hate Street on their majestic chrome-plated Harleys. I just couldn't imagine the elderly saint from Brindaban living there. How long did he stay, I asked. Four months. He lived with us American kids. We could hardly understand what the Swami was telling us. All we knew was that we were in love with him. This beautiful person sitting in a small apartment above a laundromat who was happy to meet anyone who came to see him. And what really got me was that he was always joking. Sometimes he would lie back and laugh so hard that all his teeth would show and tears would roll down his face. The riverbank was beginning to grow dark and chilly, the air filling with wood smoke from village cooking fires. I suggested we walk along the river to Keshikat. We both rose to our feet and he dusted off his backside. As we walked along, Shamsundar continued, telling me how Prabhupada won the hearts of the Beatles, especially George Harrison and how devotees became such close friends with the superstars, residing in John Lennon's home for months. Shamsundar asked, How could that happen if not by divine providence? All I could do was smile. And Prabhupada didn't want anything from these guys. He just wanted to give them the secret of life, In the first meeting with John and George, Prabhupada saw into their hearts. And he was so charming, telling them very simply that Krishna is the supreme person and describing what he looked like, what he said and did, how much he loved music and singing and dancing. And then he promised them they could meet Krishna face to face. Stopping in my tracks, I couldn't believe I was hearing about the Beatles. While walking along the bank of the Yamuna River in Brindaban, 
I just had to laugh. Shamsundar stopped for a moment, excited to tell this story. As his tears streamed down his cheek, he stuttered. I remember before their first meeting, George whispered to me outside Prabhupada's door that he was really scared, more so than going on Ed Sullivan or meeting Elvis. But when he bowed down and Prabhupada greeted him heartily, it was like watching two ancient friends united, taking up where they left off. On the way out, after the first meeting, George turned to me and said, Yeah, Prabhupada is the real thing. It had been over a year since I had last listened to rock and roll music. 10,000 miles from home, in a village in India, it had been the farthest thing from my mind. Still, I relished the idea that George Harrison of the Beatles was taking his spiritual life so seriously. I was feeling him to be a brother, sharing my cherished ideal. What a small and wonderful world, I thought. As I sat on the steps at Keshi Ghat with my new friend, I observed meteor showers to the north. Shamsundar looked up and began telling me about Srila Prabhupada's visit to Russia. In those days, because of the Iron Curtain, nobody could get into Russia. But once again, Krishna paved the way to facilitate his devotees' desire. We had no plan, no proper food. We stayed in tiny, ill-lit rooms, and there was an overall depressing atmosphere of fear and repression and gloom. What were we going to do for five days? Shamsundar went on to say that he had been wandering around Red Square when he met the son of the Indian ambassador and a young Russian man named Anatoly, who came back to the hotel to meet the guru. For three days and nights, Anatoly stayed at Prabhupada's side and absorbed like a sponge everything Prabhupada taught him. Prabhupada was full of charm and humor, but also precision, as he taught Anatoly the entire Krishna consciousness process. Then we left Moscow, Prabhupada and I together. But from that seed, now Krishna's teachings are spreading like wildfire underground, behind the Iron Curtain. Looking upstream into the horizon, I recalled growing up in America indoctrinated with fear of the Russians. As school children, we had air raid drills and were trained to duck under our desks in the event of a Russian bomb attack. In fact, several of the wealthier families in my neighborhood built fully stocked nuclear bomb shelters in their backyards, anticipating such an attack from Russia. Yet, in the height of the Cold War, Sham Sundar and Srila Prabhupada were in Moscow blissfully teaching the path of bhakti yoga to a Russian. I asked, why has Srila Prabhupada brought all you Western devotees to India? Sham Sundar looked thoughtfully into the distance before answering. Prabhupada has often told us that real religion in this country is waning. Instead of God, he says, people want television and cars. I thought of the false guru I had met in Janakpur, whose highest ambition was to be a rich American. Shamsundar continued, So I think he came back here and brought some of us along to say to the Indian people, Just see! These Western boys and girls have everything, TVs and cars, more than you will ever have. And they were not happy until they found Krishna. You have something they want, Krishna, so you should export Krishna. Prabhupada has often said that with India's philosophy and America's wealth, the world can really prosper. 
he calls us Western devotees his dancing white elephants. I laughed and considered the brilliance of synthesizing Eastern philosophy with Western wealth and technology. I realized that I had been so immersed in searching for God in my own life that thoughts of how to bring spirituality to others were far from my mind. I asked, and how are the people of India receiving all of you? Here in India, wherever we go, there are festivals of joy to greet us. But sometimes Srila Prabhupada is criticized to the point of death threats for giving initiation to Westerners, ignoring the caste system, or for engaging women in priestly duties. This impressed me. During my travels in India, I had witnessed oppression to the lower castes and women, and it had saddened me. Srila Prabhupada's courage to fight against it inspired me. Sham Sundar continued, Srila Prabhupada is truly a revolutionary. He bent down to splash some water from the river on his face to refresh himself and then stood up and stretched. Krishna Das, it is really a pleasure to meet with you tonight. Is there anything else I can do for you? What can I say? I rose to my feet. I'm just so grateful. I placed my hand on his shoulder. But I've taken so much of your time. I'll see you in class tomorrow. Shamsundar smiled. Thank you. You're right. I had better be getting back. He reached down and took my hands in his. Srila Prabhupada will be very happy to hear that you and I met. As I watched him hasten away, I felt immense gratitude, and along with that, a sense of blooming curiosity. Chapter 13 In the precious, quiet moments just before dawn, it was natural to feel close to God. Rising from the bank of the river, I left for the morning lecture. Srila Prabhupada began, as if picking up from my own waking thoughts. Everything is potentially spiritual. Everything is the energy of the Lord. Material consciousness is to forget an object's relationship with God. Spiritual consciousness is to see everything in relation to God and utilize everything in devotional service. Prabhupada tapped the microphone to make his point. Let us take this microphone for example. If it is used to sing songs about mundane passion, it is material. If, however, it is used to sing the glories of the Lord, it is spiritual. It's all a matter of consciousness. We want to use everything for a spiritual cause. Bhakti Yoga is the art of transforming material energy into spiritual energy through a spirit of devotion. Like an earthquake, his words shook my world. I thought, this concept is revolutionary. It challenges the very core of my idea of detachment. I had assumed detachment meant to give up everything and live with nothing but the barest minimum to survive. When I honestly searched deep into my heart, I had to admit that in a subtle way, I was proud of the way I had been living in India and even thought it superior to the way people lived in the West. But perhaps this idea of detachment is just another product of self-deceiving ego 
inducing me to feel superior to others. My reality was shaken. It was easy to think of the beautiful natural surroundings in Vrindavan and the temples to the deities as spiritual. But a microphone? I thought of how I had judged Prabhupada's Western followers for carrying cameras and tape recorders. I reflected how foolish it was of me to look down on them, feeling that I was better because of my ascetic lifestyle. I now understand that detachment is only sacred to the degree it fosters humility, respect, and love. In a few words, Srila Prabhupada had just crushed my illusion. My ego felt battered, and yet I was thankful. It is said that a saintly personality can be softer than a rose or harder than a thunderbolt. This morning, one guest made excuse after excuse to defend his immoralities and spiritual weaknesses. Srila Prabhupada listened, and then his voice rose like thunder. If you are weak, rectify it. If you have no determination, you have no character. What makes you different from an animal? The man shrunk like a punctured balloon. Bowing down, he promised to do what he knew was right. When required, Srila Prabhupada could be very strict to emphasize the urgency of a person's predicament. Like a scalpel in the hands of an expert surgeon, his strong words cut only to heal. Or as he explained himself, a spiritual teacher is required to have the courage of a British general and the heart of a Bengali mother. Srila Prabhupada went on to say, addressing us all in a pleading tone, When a drop of water falls from the clouds, it is transparent. But in contact with dirt, it loses its transparency. Through filtration, we can bring it back to its original quality. Similarly, our consciousness is originally pure. But in contact with material energy, it has lost its transparency. By chanting the names of the Lord, we can revive our natural, blissful state. He explained how we must rise above sectarianism and understand that God had many names and had invested divine powers within all of them. He said, The name Krishna means all-attractive. He is all-attractive because He is the reservoir of all beauty, knowledge, strength, wealth, fame, and renunciation. Possessing a particle of these qualities makes a person great. God is great. He is the origin of all these opulences and possesses them without limit. That is what is meant by the Supreme Personality of Godhead. He went on to explain that it was a natural process. The more we hear about Krishna, the more the soul's dormant attraction to him is awakened. The path of bhakti is centered around hearing about Krishna and chanting his holy names. As our love awakens, so does our enthusiasm to serve. Often I had heard the words, God is great. But this explanation of how he was great thrilled me. Chills ran through my body. That evening, I sat on the hill crowned by the ancient Madan Mohan temple. Overlooking the river Yamuna, I read a prayer written by Srila Prabhupada when he was stranded on that cargo ship in the middle of the ocean on his voyage to America. Seventy years old, he had endured consecutive heart attacks on the trip. He had only seven dollars in Indian currency, and he did not know a single soul outside of India. After thirty days at sea, he approached 
the Boston Harbor, where he composed a personal prayer to Lord Krishna. Years later, his followers happened to find it in an old trunk. In the solitude of that mountaintop, the leaves of the trees rustled in the wind, and in the distance I heard the lowing of cows and boatmen calling out to each other. I meditated in the stillness of my mind on a few verses from what are now called the Jaladuta prayers, which read as follows. My dear Lord Krishna, you are so kind upon this useless soul, but I do not know why you have brought me here. Now you can do whatever you like with me. But I guess you have some business here, otherwise why would you bring me to this place? Somehow or other, O oh Lord, you have brought me here to speak about you. Now, my Lord, it is up to you to make me a success or failure, as you like. O oh, spiritual master of all the worlds, I can simply repeat your message. So if you like, you can make my power of speaking suitable for their understanding. Only by your causeless mercy will my words become pure. I am sure that when this transcendental message penetrates their hearts, they will certainly feel engladdened and thus become liberated from all unhappy conditions of life. O oh Lord, I am just like a puppet in your hands. So if you have brought me here to dance, then make me dance, make me dance, O oh Lord, make me dance as you like. I have no devotion, nor do I have any knowledge, but I have strong faith in the holy name of Krishna. I have been designated as Bhaktivedanta, one who possesses devotion and knowledge. And now, if you like, you can fulfill the real purport of Bhaktivedanta. Signed, the most unfortunate, insignificant beggar, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami, on board the ship Jaladuta, Commonwealth Pier, Boston, Massachusetts, USA, 18th of September, 1965. From the hilltop, I gazed down toward the Yamuna as she wound across the plains. As I meditated on Srila Prabhupada's prayer, my thoughts drifted to the parallels between my arduous journey from America to India in search of teachers to receive knowledge about God and Srila Prabhupada's incredible voyage from India to America in search of students to impart knowledge about God. Perhaps God, I thought, reveals true love to the world through the lives of those who love Him. In Prabhupada's prayer, I found humility springing from the heart of a man who had forsaken everything for the spiritual welfare of others. An aged man who was seriously ill, penniless, and alone in a foreign land, begging God for only one blessing, to be used as an instrument of God's mercy. Early the next morning, awakened by distant temple bells, I lay on the riverbank for a long time, gazing at the morning star and remembered the prayers I'd read the night before. Today was Srila Prabhupada's eighth and final day in Vrindavan. As was my custom, I bathed in the frigid waters and then stood in prayer, submerged to my shoulders. The soft moonlight shone on the silhouettes of the distant temple spires. Silence covered the ether like a feathery blanket. Solitude was my only companion at this hour. 
trembling in the cold, I press my palms and fingers together and pray to Sri Radha and Krishna for guidance. Then I climbed onto the river bank, squeezed the water from my clothes and put them back on, all the while quaking from the cold. I sat down to chant the holy names of the Lord on wooden prayer beads, preoccupied with Srila Prabhupada's departure from Vrindavan later that day. An hour later, I was striding through the dim lanes of Vrindavan, eager to attend Prabhupada's last talk. Along the way, interspersed with the quiet of dawn, temple bells and gongs rang, the faithful sang, and shopkeepers were opening for business. Arriving, I took my seat on the floor. The hall was brimming over with disciples and guests, softly chanting the Maha Mantra, while a clay drum and hand cymbals kept a rhythm. In the chill of the winter morning, some were bundled with wool shawls, hats, or sweaters. A sweet fragrance rose from burning sticks of sandalwood incense, while a bitter-sweet feeling rose from the assembly. No one wanted to see Srila Prabhupada leave Vrindavan. As Srila Prabhupada entered, the kirtan rose in volume and tempo only to fade into a silent hush as he took his seat upon the dais. The rays of the rising winter sun came through the window and bathed his form in light. Outside, the parrots sang their elaborate songs. To this avian symphony, Srila Prabhupada added the chimes of brass finger cymbals. Then, closing his eyes, he sang a beautiful devotional prayer. Jaya Radha Madhava Kunja Bihari Gopi Janna Ballaba Giri As he sang of the love between the Lord and his loving devotees, I listened to the voice of my heart. It said, Srila Prabhupada's love for God is conquering me. Srila Prabhupada's singing flowed through my ears and streamed down into my chest. I felt that all the events of my life thus far had been conspiring to bring me to this point. From the very core of my heart welled a spirit of acceptance that, yes, God had revealed my Guru. I felt my soul rising and swirling in an enormous wave of faith that was plunging me into an ocean of gratitude. In this unfamiliar state, joy flooded my heart. I thought back to my first meeting with Srila Prabhupada in Bombay. At that time, a voice in my heart had proclaimed, This is your Guru. But I was neither convinced by nor ready to accept what that voice commanded. So while my mind had done battle with my heart, I dismissed it and carried on with my search, a search that eventually brought me to Vrindavan and to Krishna. Now my heart and mind were harmonized by a power infinitely greater than either one. Yes, yes, I could hear my heart rejoicing. My quest, which had begun half a planet away in Highland Park, Illinois, had finally delivered me to the feet of my guru. In that moment, I realized that there could be no greater goal in my life than helping Srila Prabhupada to spread God's love to the world. How I longed to even be the smallest instrument in that compassionate mission. Gradually, other thoughts arose. I recalled the Egyptian mystic in the Himalayas who had prophesied, 
you must persevere with patience, for by a power beyond your own you will recognize the very one you seek. Believe in this, it is your destiny. Your master will come to you. His prediction had come to pass. My Lord had revealed a seed of faith in my master, and I seemed to be swimming in a sea of euphoria. But within the span of a few earthly moments, I had to honestly face my own reality. I thought, can I really remain faithful to my Guru's teachings? There are endless temptations in this world. To disgrace him would be an act of unthinkable ingratitude. And to, though I am coming to respect them, his Western disciples are so different from me. Can I live among them? I have great faith in Srila Prabhupada, but little in myself. Am I honestly qualified to be his disciple? Tears welled in my eyes, my limbs tingled, and my heart pulsated with a warm feeling as I concluded that I was not qualified, but was determined to prepare myself with the passing of time. As the morning sun warmed the world from a chilly winter morning, I drifted along in a sizable crowd that was gathering outside to bid Srila Prabhupada and his followers farewell. Moments later, the flow of the crowd pushed me in such a way that I found myself standing right before him gazing into his deep brown eyes and he into mine. A mystical feeling overwhelmed me. It was as if the Lord himself were gazing into my soul through Srila Prabhupada's eyes. Everything else seemed to disappear. He stood calmly, waiting for me to speak. With a choked voice and my emotions swirling in gratitude, I shyly said, Srila Prabhupada, I wish to offer you my life. Countless time passed in the silent moment that followed. Then he graciously touched my joined hands with his fingertips and gently smiled. His eyes moistened with affection were like those of a father welcoming home his wayward son after untold years of separation. In his gaze, I encountered an endless sea of wisdom that stretched beyond time. I felt a love, deep yet personal, giving me a comfort I had never known. With a slight nod, he said, Yes. You are home. A surge of gratitude pushed tears through my eyes and struggling to restrain my bursting emotions, I bowed. Srila Prabhupada tilted his head, handed his cane to my friend Shamsundar and stepped into his car, smiling and bowing his head to his friends and admirers. With many cheers, waves, and tears, we watched as the entourage drove off into the horizon. I stood motionless, gazing into the clear morning sky. Today, I felt that the sun of faith had risen from the shadows of my mind. It was a sun that I believed would never set. An outpouring of gratitude sprung from my heart. For this blessing, I had endured dangers and hardships. For this treasure, my whole journey had been taken. For this precious moment, my soul had ached and yearned. God had revealed my path. The fog of doubt and apprehension had cleared, and now I found myself 
before a fully enlightened spiritual master to whom I could dedicate my life. That for which I had offered thousands of prayers and shed countless tears to attain was now revealed. And how sweetly it was done. My joy knew no bounds. In this person, Srila Prabhupada, embodied the teachings I'd discovered at the heart of every tradition I'd scrutinized. I experienced the timeless love and the wisdom of galaxies of saints flooding from his lips and drowning my every doubt as he spoke. He delivered a message that had been preserved through the ages by an unbroken line of masters who teach us how to realize our intimate relation with the all-attractive Beloved. In my heart had awakened a faith that this humble saint, so small of frame, was actually fully in love with Krishna, and that Krishna, the Supreme Lord, was fully in love with him. During my travels, it had not been my practice to compare my teachers as if one were better than another. I simply absorbed, like a sponge, their teachings and the experiences I had with them, with faith that God would reveal my path and guru. In Bombay, Srila Prabhupada first planted the seed of our relationship in my heart. Like a spiritual conception, it remained hidden, gestating, while I found my way to Krishna's birthplace in Vrindavan and made it my home. Now, nine months from the time of that spiritual conception, it had taken birth in this holy land. Looking back into the events of my life, I began to recognize how the invisible hand of my Lord had carried me along. I could see every stage of my life as being a beautiful blessing. I looked back at the times of joy and sorrow, pride and shame, successes and failures, and how they all led me forward on my path. I recalled those who had showered me with affection, like Kailash Baba, and those who despised me or plotted to destroy me, like the assailants in Istanbul. They were all part of a beautiful plan. As the water of a river finally finds its place in the sea, my life's calling finally brought me to the feet of my Krishna and my beloved Guru. With tears of gratitude, I could feel my Lord proclaiming, I am here. It is I who have brought you here and this is he to whom you belong. Lost in thought, I walked back to the small room in the ancient temple where Prabhupada had resided for six years as a recluse. Sitting on the floor in the tiny space where Prabhupada would cook, I gazed out the window and couldn't believe what I was seeing. Only a few meters away from Srila Prabhupada's hermitage, was the samadhi or tomb of Rupa Goswami, the very place where I had a life-changing revelation and where my spiritual path was finally revealed. I returned to my place on the riverbank and savored the experience of that unforgettable day. The night grew late. Under the quiet of the moonlight, I reflected on my fascination with rivers throughout my journey. Each one drew me to her banks where she nourished me with wisdom and provided me a sanctuary. Searching into the waves of the Yamuna with my mind's eye, I could also see that creek in Gettysburg, the stream in Luxembourg, the canals in Amsterdam, the Thames in London, the Tiber in Rome, and the beautiful Ganges. Each 
had whispered to me at critical junctures and times of need. Now, gazing into her gentle current, I meditated on how the Yamuna River began her journey in the Himalayas, where she flowed through forest dwellings of yogis and sages, and eventually, by a power beyond her own, Yamuna was irresistibly drawn to Brindaban. In a similar way, I thought, arriving in India, I began my journey in the Himalayas, where the river of my destiny carried me through forest dwellings of yogis and sages, and eventually, by a power beyond my own, I was irresistibly drawn to Brindaban, the land of Bhakti, and to the feet of my guru. In the moonlight, I looked down into the river and saw the silhouette of my own reflection. All along, the Lord had been trying to show me, through the river of life, who I really was. As I lay down on the earthen river bank, I remembered how I had prayed to my Lord in my bedroom in Highland Park, and I smiled. Yes, all along, you have been listening. Chapter 14 It was April of 1972, and almost four months had passed since Srila Prabhupada's departure from Vrindavan. Since he'd left, I had been absorbed in my spiritual practices, in quiet forests, and in spending time visiting the people and temples I had come to love so dearly. I hoped to stay forever, but my visa was soon to expire, and the day of my departure from Vrindavan and from India drew closer. It seemed like so long ago, while en route to the Himalayas, that I found myself mysteriously stranded here on the day of Lord Krishna's birth. What I had longed for, my spiritual path, and my beloved Guru had been revealed here. In the final days before leaving, I bowed my head to the forest and all the temples and people who captured my heart. I counted each moment that remained as an undeserved fortune. One morning, just days before my departure, I was sitting with Ganesham and some of our friends in his closet room temple, where they showered me with kindness and gifts to help me remember Vrindavan. A devoted Australian woman named Radha Dasi, who was a follower of Sripad Baba and the only other Westerner in Vrindavan beside Asim and myself, painted different scenes of Vrindavan in a notebook as a gift to help me feel at home while away. On the day before my departure, Asim and I visited a place very dear to us, Govardhan Hill. For millennia, pilgrims and saints had circumambulated this mountain and honored even the smallest stone from its ground. For here, the most intimate pastimes of love had been enacted between Radha and Krishna. When only seven years old, Krishna had effortlessly lifted this mountain and held it with a single finger like an umbrella to protect the devotees from a devastating rain for seven days. Amid tranquil forests, lakes, 
cows and hundreds of devoted pilgrims, we walked the 14 miles around Govardhan Hill, feeling both joy and sorrow. For the next day, I would be gone. Returning to Brindaban village, I roamed about to the places I treasured most. Collecting dusty soil at each place, I sprinkled it into a small cloth pouch so that I could bring Brindaban with me wherever I was destined to be. I prayed to Krishna, wherever life takes me, please allow me to always keep you in my heart. That night, on the bank of the Yamuna, I sat in the starlight, chanting my mantra. At sunrise the next morning, Asim accompanied me to the Brindaban railway station, where we boarded a train to Mathura. Once on board, we shared our hearts and our favorite food, braja rotis and gur. My eyes teared, thinking how I would miss this food of the poor farmers. I said, I don't know when I'll ever see braja rotis and gur again. Asim smiled and handed me a cloth bag. Please open it, he said. It was filled with a couple dozen thick braja rotis and a lump of gur. At the Mathura railway station, we disembarked and stood waiting for the train that would carry me out of India and into Nepal. There on that railway platform, I bade farewell to my friend and brother. Together we had shared unforgettable experiences. As the train lumbered into the station, I struggled to control my emotions. I couldn't believe I had to leave the place I loved so dearly, the place where Krishna had answered my prayers. Tears streamed down my face. Asim clasped my hand in reassurance. He smiled through his tears and spoke a blessing. Krishna Das, wherever you remember Krishna, you will find Vrindavan. I will be praying for your return. I could not speak, for already I was overwhelmed with the grief of separation. With joined palms, we exchanged pranams. Thank you for everything. I said softly and climbed aboard. I bade farewell to Brindavan, my spiritual home, as the locomotive chugged away. I traveled on to Kathmandu, wondering if there would be something waiting for me at the American Express office. There was. Although I had written to him that I could find my way back on my own, my father, eager to see me, had wired a $350 money order for my airfare. At the Indian Embassy in Kathmandu, I was issued a new two-week transit visa for India, where I could catch my plane and fly from New Delhi to Belgium, and then on to the U.S. Prior to my departure from Kathmandu, I took a nostalgic walk to Swayambhunath and gazed out at that fateful rice paddy where I had been reunited with Gary. I missed my old friend. So many dramatic events had unfolded in my life since our paths diverged, and I longed to share them with him. I thought, I am still living as a homeless wanderer. Is he? It would take another miracle for us to meet again. I then wandered along the bank of the Bagmati River to Pashupatinath. Sitting on the riverbank in the moonlit night, I recalled the tears of longing I had shed here a year before and the many blessings I had received since that night. In the morning, I bade farewell 
and solitary wanderer that I had become boarded the back of a truck to the Pokhara Valley, one of the most beautiful routes back toward India. The valley was surrounded by snow-clad Himalayan peaks. I found a place to stay in a cave hidden on the face of a steep cliff high above a river. For the next seven days, I rode a canoe to the center of the Fuala Lake, where I performed my meditations from sunrise to sunset. During that week, I hardly saw a soul, except for an occasional farmer or fisherman. On the seventh day, two days before my Nepali visa was to expire, I spoke softly to the mountains, to the sky, and to the water. I say goodbye to you, beautiful Pokhara. Tomorrow, I must depart. After rowing to the shore, I laid the oar across my canoe and in the last light of day, walked across the fields. In a remote forest, as I crossed a dark, lonely road and began the descent back to my cave, a bus jostled by. With my first step down the cliff, I suddenly heard a strange scream. Curious, I turned. The bus momentarily halted about 20 yards away and then drove off. Out from the growing darkness, a ghostly figure scurried toward me. Am I being attacked? Should I flee? As the shadow advanced, I strained to make out who this was. Step by step, the silhouette was becoming clearer. Could it be? My God, it is! Gary! I leaped in the air and dashed to meet him. Wild with joy, grateful beyond words, we embraced. Stunned, we could only repeat, It's God's will. Behind Gary was another familiar form running in from the dark. Who could this possibly be? Impossible! It was our friend, Hackett, from Brooklyn. It had been at Hackett's home that I received Gary's call, the call that catapulted my journey. The words Hackett had spoken on hearing that we were going to Europe now rung in my heart. I'll track you guys down in heaven or hell. Mark my words. Sure enough, he tracked us down. 2,700 feet above sea level in the heaven of a Himalayan valley. Now, nearly two years later, the three of us stood mesmerized under the stars on that remote mountainside in Nepal. I invited them to spend the night with me. They followed behind as I climbed down the steep cliff onto the plateau outside my cave. My two friends stood amazed to see my residence, a primitive cave in the wall of a cliff in the middle of nowhere. Together we sat on the stone floor. As hospitality, I offered them chipped rice and creek water with some of my remaining brujarotis and gur. Without utensils, they resorted to eating with their bare fingers. Putting down his wooden bowl, Gary said, We left Kathmandu on the bus this morning on our way for a trek in the mountains. He scratched his head, still staggered by our reunion. Monk or Richard, or what is your name now? Some people call me Krishnadas. Well, Krishnadas, I was sleeping on the moving bus, and just as I opened my eyes, I caught a glimpse of the headlights momentarily flashing on you as you were climbing down the cliff. I screamed out for the bus to stop and jumped out 
in the middle of nowhere. Gary grinned. No one will ever believe this. Hackett couldn't contain himself. Dropping his bowl to the floor, he exclaimed, I'm a witness, and even I don't believe it. His eyes flashed in thought. I guess you're right. There must be a God. We fell silent at the wonder of it all. From our little shelf high above the river, we stared dreamily at silhouettes of mountains far across the valley. Finally, I broke the silence. I'm very sorry to say it, but I have to leave tomorrow at sunrise. Still, we had the whole moonlit night before us. Hackett was dead tired from the arduous bus journey, so despite his struggle to stay awake, he soon fell asleep. Gary and I, meanwhile, had catching up to do. Gary told me how he, too, had lived as a sadhu, visiting ashrams and holy places, and I told him about Vrindavan. When he considered my present predicament, he grinned. Gary said, Who can understand you, Krishnadas? You now have money that your father sent you, and still you choose to live in a forest cave. Amazing. I hadn't even thought about this until he mentioned it. Yes, I admitted. It's been so long, Gary, I've forgotten how to spend money. In that mystical place, overlooking the river valley, we shared the experiences and realizations of our respective quests. All night long we gazed out across the valley, watching the moon spread silvery light on the nearby mountains. Below us, the song of the river sounded steadily. Over the years, Gary had witnessed the transformations of my life. As small children, we played together, went to school together, got in trouble together. As teenagers, we rebelled against the social norms and entered the counterculture. In Europe, we explored the arts and cultures of new places. He had watched as my spiritual yearnings gradually shaped my destiny. We traveled together as my calling drew me to prayer in synagogues, monasteries, and cathedrals and meditation in caves and mountains. From a cave in Crete, I left to follow that inner call. Then a year later, in a rice paddy in Nepal, he found me as a hardcore renunciate, seasoned by a life of asceticism with yogis and lamas. At that time, I was still longing, still searching for my path and my guru, Tonight, he found his old friend fixed in dedication to a path revealed by the one God. The Lord had led me to my beloved spiritual father, Srila Prabhupada, whose divine grace attracted my faith and love. Now, with a whole heart, I was striving to develop humility, love for Krishna, and a genuine spirit of service to mankind. As the sun was rising, a tear streamed down Gary's cheek and dropped into his beard. He whispered, I'm so happy for you, brother. God has fulfilled your prayers. Gary smiled. It's been an amazing journey. I closed my eyes and took a deep breath. It was time to say goodbye again. We gave each other bear hugs and wished each other safe travels. Smiling, I turned and climbed the steep hill toward the road. My brother, Gary called to me. From halfway up the mountain cliff, I grasped onto a rock for support and looked down at the plateau 
where Geary stood. A lost look covered his face, and tears welled in his eyes. Rubbing his beard, he called out, I wonder if we'll ever meet again. I looked on the Himalayan cave that had given me shelter and listened to the enchanting song of the river below. With tears of gratitude, I called out to Gary, I believe we will, if we continue to follow the inner call. At the New Delhi airport, I boarded an Air India flight to Aston, Belgium. Dressed in the robes of a mendicant and caring for my baggage, only a cloth bag around my shoulder and a metal begging pot. I was a strange sight among international tourists and businessmen. An Irishman seated next to me in economy class puffed incessantly on one cigarette after another. The smoke burned my eyes and suffocated my breath, but the smoker seemed not the least concerned. The challenge of returning to the West had already begun. Seeing the hostess serving meals sparked my memory. In my bag was a treasure that could transform this airplane into a spiritual oasis. My dear brother Asim's gift of brudger rotis and gur. They may have been old and dry, but they were utterly delectable to me. On that flight, 35,000 feet in the sky, I jubilantly ate my brudger rotis and gur while absorbed in remembrance of my spiritual home. From Belgium, I hitchhiked to Holland to visit the first friends Gary and I had met in Europe. Traveling to Cosmos's house in Abkoda, I learned from his mother that he had moved to Amsterdam. When I arrived at their apartment unexpectedly, Cosmas, Hush, and their friends leaped up and rushed to the door to greet me. Loud rock and roll music blared as some drank beer while others puffed on marijuana. In the cloud of smoke, men and women lay in passionate embraces. My heart was sinking. Just two days before, I had been living with sages in a holy forest in India. And now, here I stood in the midst of this party scene, in my sadhu robes, with my prayer beads and begging bowl. Disoriented, I contemplated. What has happened to my friends? Then I remembered my encounter with Sean in Connaught Circus, and it dawned on me. The real question is, what has happened to me? We spoke for a couple hours, then I politely bade them farewell. Entering into the streets of Amsterdam, the entire environment seemed so foreign. How people dressed and related to one another seemed strange. Evening came, so I checked into a youth hostel, where I was given the bottom bed of a bunk in a common room. I thought, maybe while I lie quietly in bed, I can adjust my mind to these drastic changes. Only a day before, I had been in a quiet, holy place on the banks of a sacred river. Now I was in Amsterdam. Weary from my journey, I drifted into sound sleep. Suddenly, in the darkness of the night, my bed began to rattle and shake. As I bounced about, I wondered if this were an earthquake. Then I understood. From the bunk bed above came the sounds of passionate moans and groans of a young man and woman. I was really not ready for this cultural adjustment. Where am I? Why am I here? Where is my sleeping place at the banks of the holy river? I slipped out of the hostel 
and walked the streets until morning. When morning came, I sat in a small park to eat my remaining brajarotis and gur. Later that day, I wrote a letter to my parents explaining that I wouldn't be flying home right away. I needed a little more time to readjust to the Western world. Back in Amsterdam, I ate a diet of peanuts mixed with yogurt. I didn't know how to be a vegetarian in the West, but I did like my simple diet very much. One night, I visited the Cosmos. This was the nightclub where I first met that strange-looking man with a shaved head and ponytail who poured the ladle of runny fruit salad into my palms. And that same man, Sham Sundar, had appeared again in Bombay and in Brindavan to become my dear friend. I marveled at the twists and turns of my life, feeling myself to be completing a circle. It was about 11 o'clock on a Saturday night when I left and inadvertently found myself walking along a main street rowdy with hundreds of American sailors and flashing with neon lights. On both sides were overcrowded discotheques, pubs, nightclubs, and brothels. Live music blared from both sides and the smell of liquor and burning animal flesh filled the air. I still wore the garb of a sadhu. A heavily perfumed prostitute with shiny red lips and thick mascara grabbed my hand to drag me away, but I resisted. A gang of drunken sailors surrounded me. They yelled, What kind of freak are you? and shoved me back and forth to one another. While one pinned me across the chest, another howled with laughter. Have a drink, buddy, he said, and poured a gallon pitcher of cold beer over my head. What planet had I landed on? Finally, they released me. Now I found myself roaming aimlessly, in a jungle with predators more intimidating to my mind than the leopards, elephants, and serpents of the Himalayas. Wandering desperately in that vast city, I found myself on a narrow lane in the red light district. Brothels lined both sides of the street and rats scampered in the shadows. From inside picture windows, Prostitutes posed in various states of undress, trying to seduce customers. A sign over one storefront advertised in large letters, Sex Shop. To the left of the sex shop was a garage door with a smaller door carved into it. Above it read a sign, Radha Krishna Temple. Could this be... I knocked. Opening it, a smiling devotee exclaimed, Please come in and make yourself at home. After taking a shower, I sat down to recover. Sweet spiritual music played softly. Religious art with scenes of Radha and Krishna in Vrindavan decorated the walls. Musk-scented incense filled the air. Have some hot milk, said the devotee. The steaming milk was lightly flavored with banana and cardamom. In great relief, I looked around. I felt I'd come out of a vast desert and entered an oasis. And then, on the wall, I saw a painting of Srila Prabhupada. Gently smiling, he seemed to be once again welcoming me home. Silently, I thanked him for making the trip from India on that cargo ship so many years back. As a result of his efforts, hundreds of such oases were later to be established throughout the world. From Amsterdam, I went to London, 
where I spent some time in an ashram near the British Museum. Then I boarded a flight to New York. On reaching the U.S. immigration desk, I was greeted by a female officer who scrutinized every page of my passport. She called someone on the phone and then stamped one of the pages. As I walked forward, two big men in business suits stepped in front of me. They looked frighteningly official as they flashed a badge in my face. They confiscated my passport. We are federal agents. Come with us. They led me to a private room and stared me down. An agent declared, You're being held for smuggling illegal narcotics into the United States. If you voluntarily surrender and cooperate with us, your punishment will be reduced. I have no narcotics, I replied meekly. We know for certain that you do. Surrender them or we'll find them. He slammed his fist against a hardwood table. I warn you, don't make us angry. They thoroughly searched my bag. Finding the small pouches filled with my collection of Brindaban dirt, they elated. Dangling it in front of my face, an agent challenged, What is this? It's dirt from a holy place. He carefully examined the dirt, rubbing it with his fingers and smelling it. Disappointed, he closed the pouch and put it aside. One of the agents frisked my body. Suddenly his eyes lit up as he clapped his hand together in a fit of excitement. I found it! I found it! The dope is here! He felt a hard lump at the base of my back. What is this? he shouted. It's my loincloth. They had obviously never seen Aisadu's loincloth. Strip off your clothes, they demanded. I took everything off except the loincloth. What's that? shouted an agent, taken back. The leader mocked, It sure ain't fruit of the loom. They examined my loincloth, which was stained by hundreds of baths in muddy rivers and ponds. Put on your clothes, they said. Then with an official politeness, one agent explained, that the stamps from Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Nepal on my passport were red flags for narcotics import. He apologized. We're sorry for the inconvenience, but please understand, it's our duty to protect America. Handing me my passport, they escorted me through U.S. Customs to the door. I had left home as a teenage student, going for a summer vacation to Europe, and returned two years later as an ascetic following an ancient spiritual path. By the time I returned, my family had sold our home in Highland Park and bought an apartment in Miami Beach, Florida. From JFK, I caught a domestic flight to Miami. My father, on crutches with a broken leg, came with my little brother Larry to the airport. They found me sitting on the floor, meditating with closed eyes, holding nothing but a faded cotton bag and a metal begging pot. My father choked up with excitement and burst out, Son, thank God, you're finally home. I jumped up to greet him. His eyes welled with tears as he wrapped his arms around me in a tight embrace. He sighed, as if years of pain were finally being lifted. Thrilled, my little brother Larry, now seventeen, smiled as we shared a brotherly hug. He stared at me as if I were some kind of returning hero. As we entered our new apartment, my mother ran to the door and cried out, Richard, how we missed you! She wept tears I will never 
forget. Embracing me and kissing my forehead. You've become so thin, she said. And then went on. Look, I'm learning vegetarian cooking just for you. There, on the kitchen counter, I saw a small library of vegetarian cookbooks. Hoping only to please me, she immediately served us a dinner of soup, salad, stir-fried vegetables, a baked casserole, rice, and apple strudel for dessert. The phone rang, and it was my elder brother Marty calling me from his college in Arizona to welcome me home as well. I was overwhelmed by the lengths my parents would go to in order to make me happy. As difficult as my choice had been and would continue to be for them, they strived to understand and accept my way of life. I sincerely tried to express my love for them while upholding the ideals I held sacred. Although our lives were worlds apart, the affection and respect we shared remained prominent. Through the practice of devotion to God, I was coming to learn that preserving loving relations in this world required much forgiveness, tolerance, patience, gratitude, and humility. An essential virtue of humility is to accept others for what they are, despite differences. I contemplated again how the tendency to judge others is often a symptom of insecurity, immaturity, or selfishness, and I yearned to rise above it. Everyone is a child of God. God loves all His children. If I wish to love God, I must learn to love those whom He loves. We all knew that I wouldn't be home for long. While my mother had a beautiful room prepared for me, I chose to sleep on a cement patio that extended from our fifth floor apartment. From there, in the quiet hours before the dawn, I gazed out past a vacant swimming pool toward a bay lined with palm and eucalyptus trees that swayed in the breeze. As I meditated, the faint song of the sea whispered from a distance. I felt the patio transform into my cherished rock in the Ganges. While quietly chanting the divine mantra I had received from the river, in my mind's eye I could see the river Ganges flowing effortlessly into the same sea that now spread out before me. I felt Brindavan, my guru and my lord, to be indescribably present, beyond time and space. I took a deep breath of the salty air, and gratitude filled my heart. I smiled, folded my hands, and whispered, It has been an unbelievable journey, and... You have answered my prayers. Wherever I remember you, I feel at home.
Afterward. Nearly four decades have passed since I set off on my journey to the East. Over the years, I have realized that whether living in a holy place in India or a congested city in America, if we harmonize our lives in a spirit of devotion to the Lord, we can realize our eternal home. Shortly after returning to my family, I chose to live in an ashram in America. Two times I was offered initiation from my guru, but I declined, feeling I was still undeserving. Neither would I cut my hair nor shave my head like all the other monks until I felt absolutely ready to commit myself to initiation. In the spring of 1973, we celebrated the appearance day of Lord Chaitanya, the incarnation of Krishna for this age, and fasted till moonrise. I secluded myself in a dark attic, the closest thing I could find to a cave, and vowed to chant 100,000 names of the Lord on my wooden prayer beads. After about six hours, a special inspiration sprung from within. I prayed, My dear Lord, on your birthday, what gift can I offer you? Another hour passed as I meditated on the Maha Mantra while chanting Hare Krishna, Hare Rama. My question seemed to echo in the background. My Lord, on your birthday, what can I offer you? As I chanted the very last of the 100,000 names, a voice within my heart called an answer to my question. Offer your hair. I knew what that meant. In the past, I had resolved to only sever my hair when I was ready to accept the vows of initiation from a spiritual master. I believed that this was the voice of the Lord confirming that I was now ready to take the vows which I had refused to accept repeatedly from many great souls on my path. So in the summer of 1973, I took the formal vows of initiation. At that time, Srila Prabhupada lovingly offered me the name Radhanath Das, servant of Lord Krishna, who is the beloved of Radha. To help me remember this special day, a friend gave me a framed photograph. Neither he nor I were prepared for the stunning reaction it would invoke. My body shivered, my mouth dropped. I could not believe what I was seeing. It was the same back cover photo from the pamphlet that I had been left with at the Randall's Island Rock Festival in New York. That was the day before I received the fateful call from Gary. The day before destiny pulled me away from the life I knew and into the realm where everything had to change. Weeks later, while crammed in the back of a van while hitchhiking in England, I had looked at it for the first time and been struck by the personality in that photograph, thinking, if anyone in this creation has spiritual bliss, it is this person. I lost the pamphlet after that day and never had another thought about it. Now, for the first time, I made the connection. The person in the photograph was my guru, Srila Prabhupada. I couldn't believe it. Destiny had led me in a full circle. At the very onset of my spiritual quest, the Lord had cryptically revealed who my guru was to be and the path I was to follow. The mystery was only disclosed on the day of my initiation. For the next six years I resided in an austere monastery on a secluded mountaintop that one had to trudge a three-mile muddy footpath through a forest to reach. 
The snow-blanketed winters were frigid there, and we had no heat. To bathe we used a rock, to break a layer of ice, then dipped in the icy water. Our sanitation system was to climb down a hill with a shovel in hand and bury our waste in the mud. In this place, I found myself living a similar life as Ganesham, day and night serving the Lord's deity form, trying intensely to follow spiritual disciplines, and also tending cows. After years spent there in meditation on my guru's compassion, I developed a deep longing to share the gifts I received with others. For the next eight years, I served as a lecturer in colleges and universities, mainly in Ohio and western Pennsylvania. Professors invited me to speak on topics such as philosophy, religion, sociology, interfaith, the Bhagavad Gita, and I also taught courses on vegetarian cooking. My beloved Gurudev, Srila Prabhupada, departed from this world in Vrindavan on November 14, 1977. That day is forever etched in my heart. In separation from him, I felt myself cast into emptiness. As relentless tears washed away all my patience, my heart cried out, Where to go now? My dearest friend and guide has left me alone in this world of conflict and confusion. How will I carry on without his love, his smile, and his wisdom? Now I had to realize his presence was within my heart. My sincerity would be tested by how I followed his sacred instructions to love Krishna and be an instrument of that love in my life. But for one who follows sincerely, the Guru is always present to guide and protect the disciple. Service in separation is a test of our gratitude and love, and that separation, I found, is also the sweetest union. In 1982, the Society of Devotees urged me to accept the vows of a Swami, a celibate monk exclusively dedicated to God's service. Extremely apprehensive, I resisted, because I felt that the honor and distinction that comes with being a Swami was a burden and a distraction. Besides that, I felt unworthy. However, appeals and pressures came repeatedly. What should I do? I prayed to Srila Prabhupada and the Lord. In the months that followed, my seniors and the voice of my guru within revealed that the primary consideration should be how I could best serve the Lord. In May of 1982, I accepted the vows of sannyas. Conferred upon me at that time was the title, Radhanath Swami. In 1983, I returned to India for the first time in 11 years. I traveled by airplane from London to New Delhi, the same trip that took me over six months when I hitchhiked was completed in less than nine hours by airplane. The speed and safety of an airplane, though, could not compare with the life-changing experiences I'd had on the overland route. In India, I at last made pilgrimage to my most cherished home, Vrindavan. The unbounded joy of returning was mixed with the dismay of finding that almost all of my dear friends 
had passed away. I roamed from one hermitage to another only to receive the news that another friend was gone. I rushed to see one dear soul in particular, praying that I was not too late. Near the ancient ruins of a sandstone temple, I witnessed a sight that melted my heart. Sitting all alone on the stone steps was a personality whose glories were hidden from the world, but ever shining in my mind. It was dear Ganesham. His aged body had aged even more since I'd last seen him. His tiny form was now so thin and frail, it appeared that a strong breeze could knock him down to the ground. His tearful eyes gazed downward while he was slowly chanting Radha and Krishna's names. Gently, I sat right beside him. I wept in joy, whispering, Ganesham Baba, do you remember me? I have remembered you every day of my life. Looking into my face, he squinted his childlike eyes, trying to make out who this intrusive stranger was. After long seconds passed, he broke the silence with an astonished whisper. Krishna Das? Suddenly tears burst from his eyes and streamed down his cheeks. Trembling with emotion, he cried out, Krishna Das, is it you? His shaking hand stroked my cheek as he gazed deeply into my eyes. Every muscle of his aged face tensed with feeling as he cried out, Yes, it is you, Krishna Das, it is you. With great difficulty, he bowed his head onto the ground in gratitude to God. He rose slowly and timidly. He held my hand. His voice cracking, he rejoiced, Come, Krishna Das, Gopi Janabalava has been waiting so long for you. Please come. Kanasham slowly led me a few steps into that alleyway that I dreamt of so many times and into his tiny closet temple. What a feast it was to both my eyes and soul to be once again face to face with Radha Gopijana Balaba and their dearest Ganesham. He then proceeded to offer me his brajarotis and practically everything else he had. For hours, I sat in a trance of gratitude. I was home. But my duties at the universities soon called me back to America. The next year, I returned to Brindaban, elated with the prospect of seeing dear Ganesham. Shivering with anticipation, I crossed the sewage canal and entered the house. But Radha Gopi Janabalaba's intimate closet temple was now nothing more than a closet for storage. The deities were gone. For over sixty years, that simple closet had been a glorious temple for the Lord who appeared from the earth to accept the service of dear Ganesham. Now it was cluttered with brooms, cleaning buckets, underwear, and utensils. Just then the mother of the house interrupted her cooking to see what I wanted. Where is Radha Gopi Janabalaba? I inquired. They found another home, she said. Where? Where is Ganesham Baba? I cried out. Whisking her hand upward toward heaven, she replied, He has gone to Krishna. In a daze, I walked outside. There, I looked up into the Brindaban sky and wept. I whispered, 
Ganesham, you will forever dwell in the closet of my heart. There, I will ever find warmth under the blanket of your humility and be nourished by the brajarotis of your selfless love. One day in 1985, I was guiding about 20 devotees around Govardhan Hill in Vrindavan. When unprepared for a shocking surprise, I found myself face to face with my old friend Asim. Elated, we embraced in gratitude. In our last days together, 14 years before, we had also circled Govardhan Hill. It was as if we were meeting exactly where we left off. He was so proud that I was now a Swami. Finding a quiet place, we sat together. In the years since I had seen him, Asim had received a Ph.D. in Sanskrit from Columbia University. In the academic world, he was Alan Shapiro and assisted prominent scholars the world over in Sanskrit research. But still, Vrindavan was his home. Asim smiled. Wait here, Swamiji. A few minutes later, he returned with a cloth bag. An uncontrollable smile captured my face, for I knew what was in it. Marveling at the sweet will of the Lord, we gazed at the beauty of Govardhan Hill and celebrated our reunion with a feast of brejarotis and gur. Our precious friendship continued until, by the Lord's will, he passed away in 1998. My work as a Swami began to include more and more travel as I began to lecture to a wider and wider circle of people. In the summer of 1988, while in Los Angeles, a friend agreed to drive me up the coast to Big Sur to meet with a special friend, Father Bede Griffiths, a Catholic monk and author of several books that bridged the wisdom of Christianity and Hinduism. He had invited me to give a seminar in a monastery of Benedictine monks. We sped up Highway 1 with the windows open, savoring the Pacific breeze. At a gas station, my friend stopped to fill up the tank. From a phone booth on the roadside, I completed a call. Hanging up the phone, I noticed something peculiar. Right under my nose, the telephone directory was open to a page with the letters L-I-S on the top of the page. My long friend Gary's last name happened to be Liss. I scrolled my finger down the page on a whim and was shocked to find the name Gary Liss. This can't be, I thought. I haven't seen him since 1972 in that cave in Nepal. It's been 17 years. The address read Malibu Road in Malibu Beach. Looking up, I discovered a street sign directly over the phone booth. Malibu Road, it read. Gazing across the street and down the block, I saw a small house with the identical address. I reasoned that there must be thousands of people with the name Gary Liss in America. We had been warned to reach Big Sur by nightfall, and so, letting my rational mind override my excitement at the slim prospect of seeing my old friend, I noted the address and resolved to return and investigate when I could. A year later, in the summer of 1989, Returning from India, I borrowed a car and drove alone from Los Angeles up to Malibu Beach. The mystery thickened. 
where the small house had once stood, was now nothing more than a vacant lot. I asked a neighbor, what happened to that house? They tore it down last month. Do you know the name of the person who lived there? No, I'm sorry. Perplexed, I just stood there, wondering what to do. Behind the empty lot was a tennis court, and behind that was a beautiful home right on the beachfront of the Pacific Ocean. With my shaved head and saffron robes standing in a vacant lot in a posh neighborhood of Malibu, I certainly must have stood out. Suddenly, from out of the house, came a middle-aged, well-groomed man with a thick neck and huge muscles that bulged from his arms and chest. The bodybuilder stared at me with suspicion, as I did him. He strutted across the tennis court in my direction. Maybe I shouldn't be standing here, I thought. As he came closer, though, I recognized that behind all those big muscles and years of aging was someone very familiar. Blissfully, I called out, Gary! Gary! It's me! The sadhu from the cave! Do you remember? My brother, it's you! He cried out. I cannot believe my eyes! The invisible hand of the Lord had brought us together again. Eighteen years had passed, and we both looked so different. I was still about a hundred and twenty pounds, but my long locks had been replaced with a shaven head, and I wore saffron robes of a swami. Gary's long hair and beard were gone. He was clean-shaven, his short hair neatly parted. His once skinny body was now rippling with huge muscles. It was strikingly obvious that we had taken very contrary paths. A sense of apprehension stirred in both of our hearts. Do I have anything in common with this person anymore? Gary asked, What do you call yourself now, Richard, Monk, Krishnadas, or what? People call me Radhanath Swami, but you could just call me Swami. Well, Swami, he said, a lot has changed in the past eighteen years. Don't expect me to be what I used to be. Please, Gary, let's catch up on all those years. It turned out that he had torn down his old house on the lot we were standing on and was about to construct a new one. He invited me into the elegant home on the seashore that belonged to his aunt and uncle. Here we spent hours and hours catching up. From India, Gary told me, he had hitchhiked through all of Africa, South America, Central America, and then north through Mexico. He had spent almost seven years as a hardcore traveler until he finally returned to the U.S. Inspired by Mahatma Gandhi, Gary decided to become a lawyer. While preparing for his law degree, he struggled to restore the ill health brought on by traveling by focusing on bodybuilding. In the years that passed, he graduated law school and got married. But in the meantime, he happened to become a regional champion bodybuilder. When later he was offered a position as a physical trainer at the prestigious Malibu Gym, he opted to make that his career. Since then, he has made his living training the affluent people of Malibu, Hollywood, and Los Angeles. Gary, I exclaimed, I never could have believed that you would end up living on Malibu Beach as a physical trainer for the elite. The mysteries of life never cease to amaze me. In the opulent oceanfront home, we talked throughout the day and night. 
the song of the waves crashing upon the shore in the background. I sat cross-legged on the carpeted floor, leaned back against the wall and noted, Gary, although your body and social position have changed in every way, I find the same goodness, loyalty, and spiritual searching still live within you. All barriers of apprehension between us crumbled that night as we shared our thoughts from long ago. It was as if that cave in the Himalayan jungle had transformed into a luxurious home in Malibu Beach. It now seemed as if only moments passed since our last meeting, and we bonded on a higher level than ever before. After hearing my story, Gary had tears in his eyes. Swami, I've thought about you thousands of times. I knew you would be doing something like this. I'm remembering that fateful evening in Crete when that voice called you away. After all these years, you're still following that inner call. Amazing. Memories swelled up like waves and then receded into the ocean of our grateful hearts. Swami Gary said, Our lives are totally opposite. What do we have in common? I'm a physical trainer and convince people that they'll be happy with a healthy, handsome body. But you're a Swami and convince them that they'll be happy if they realize that they're not the body at all, but an eternal soul. I had to smile and replied, Because the Lord is in everyone's heart, the body is a temple of God. Gary, we can harmonize our talents. You teach people how to improve the temple, and I'll try to teach them what to do inside. Gary glowed with joy. That's it, he said. That's it. Our journey now has a new beginning. Over the years, I felt a great debt to the land and people of India. Often I would remember when I was a penniless boy in desperation at the Indian border and I made a promise to that Sikh immigration agent. I had said, Some day, I promise to do something good for your people. In 1986, I returned to make my permanent residence in India. I was feeling that where there is a great need, there is a special opportunity to serve. With this in mind, I settled in downtown Bombay. As a service to my guru and to the beautiful people of India, I was fortunate enough to help in establishing several temples as spiritual educational centers, ashrams to cultivate pure living, and a hospital that treats patients with both conventional and alternative methods of medicine with the aim of giving better quality of life to the body, mind, and soul. The hospital also reaches out with free medical camps in both the ordinary times and emergencies like terrorist acts, earthquakes, and tsunamis. Along with my lifelong friend, Ramesh Baba, and his followers, we offer an annual eye camp in Brindaban to perform about a thousand cataract surgeries each year. Over the years, we've had the opportunity to develop schools for academic, moral, and spiritual education, an orphanage for downtrodden children, a farm to demonstrate environmentally sustainable farming and cow protection, as well as kitchens that are currently feeding nutritious lunches to about 300,000 undernourished children daily in schools in the slums. Considering the rise of immorality and sectarian hatred, in several primary and high schools, we offer courses in value education 
to combine students from Hindu, Muslim, Christian, Jewish, Jain, Buddhist, and Parsi communities, teaching universal ethical values with stories and analogies from all the world's great religions, and to help inspire integrity-based leadership for the future. We hold weekly cultural programs at about 30 colleges in the area. But I must confess that this is all but an insufficient token in comparison to the treasures I have received from the people of India, both the saints and the ordinary people. They have blessed my life with Krishna, my beloved Guru, and endless opportunities to serve them and share this blessing with the world. In 1989, my mother and father visited me in India for the first time. It was a life-changing experience for them. They fell in love with the Bombay devotees, who have remained some of their dearest friends. When my beloved mother passed from this world in Chicago in 2004, my father and brothers requested that I deliver the eulogy and carry her ashes to India. They said, She took such pride in what you're doing there, and she had such love for your people. During the ceremony, on the bank of the Ganges, with almost 2,000 devotees sincerely praying and chanting, I placed her ashes into Mother Ganges. With tears of gratitude, I remembered how 34 years before I had accepted the Ganges as a mother. As the ashes merged into the flowing current, I prayed with a tearful whisper. Today, the mother of my physical birth and a mother of my spiritual birth have united, and in this beautiful current they are flowing together to reach the sea. I pray, I pray, my dear Lord, please carry Mother's soul into the sea of your eternal grace. This moment was deeply symbolic for me. Yoga means union with our spiritual essence, and religion is to bring us back to that same essence. Bhakti Yoga is the science of transforming material into spiritual. By harmonizing our relationships, talents, and property in devotion to the Lord, our spiritual love awakens. In this way, the physical body and the spirit soul are united in purpose, and the love we share in this world reaches the eternal spiritual plane. The Bhagavad Gita reveals this mystery to be the perfection of yoga and the fulfillment of life. As I look back, I am forever grateful for the journey I traveled and to all the people who helped me to grow on the way. Never could I have imagined where the invisible hand of destiny was leading me. Through it all, I have come to realize that if only we cling to our sacred ideals, not being diverted by either successes or failures, we may find that amazing powers beyond our own are there to test us, protect us, and empower us. I pray that this simple story of mine may inspire all my readers with hope. Our true home awaits us at the end of life's perilous journey. It is a place of lasting peace beckoning us to persevere until we, too, reunite with our lost love.
Author's Note Over the years, many people have pressed me to write this story. I resisted, considering it inappropriate to write a book about myself, until something happened to change my mind. In May of 2005, my lifelong friend, Bhakti Tirtha Swami, called me. He was dying and wanted me to be with him. Bhakti Tirtha Swami was an African-American who rose from the ghettos of Cleveland to become a world spiritual teacher, whose admirers included, among others, Nelson Mandela, Muhammad Ali, and Alice Coltrane. I arrived at a modest home in rural Pennsylvania where Bhakti Tirtha Swami was passing through the last stages of melanoma cancer. He looked up at me from his bed with a beaming smile and said, I want to die in your arms. Please stay with me. For the next seven weeks, I sat at his bedside, talking about mysteries and miracles and enjoying stories from the Sanskrit devotional texts. Nobody knew me better than Bhakti Tirtha Swami. He knew the details of my quest and also my hesitation to write about them. One day, he clasped my hand, gazed into my eyes, and said, This is not your story. It is a tale about how God led a young boy onto an amazing journey to seek the inner secrets that lie within all of us. Don't be miserly. Share what has been given to you. His voice choked up and a tear streaked down his ebony cheek. Promise me, he said here on my deathbed, that you will write the story. A few days later, on June 27, 2005, he passed from this world. This book is my attempt to honor his wish.